Hello, welcome to everybody. We will uh, are going to start. You can see the people here in the stage, uh, the, the people for the first panel. This is the Fandango final event. Fandango was uh, one of the first uh, projects started in this uh, analysis, uh, how to support the EU and the citizen to fight uh, this information. We started uh, more than three years ago and we investigated how artificial intelligence uh, and uh, big data and data science uh, can fight, can support the fight to disinformation. I will, uh, the first panel uh, will start uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I would like just to thank all the people here and thanks our uh, project officer, uh, Riku, that is here. And uh, I would like to stress just uh, three very uh, quick comments uh, about uh, on what we uh, on our experiences uh, after three years. The first one is that uh, this is a difficult task. Fighting this information is very difficult for human, you know, and so you can image for uh, artificial intelligence for machine. And we need uh, to improve this. So we need to work. Uh, uh, in the next year uh, to, to, to do this, uh, to improve the, the tools, the artificial intelligence, the big data, the digital tools, uh, and uh, in understanding how to improve this, uh, this uh, supporting. And we need uh, to do this, uh, I would like to stress that we need data. We need uh, uh, more data we can have, uh, better we can, uh, we can improve our tools. The second point uh, is that uh, human should be in the loop. There is nothing that we can do automatically. At the end of the day, always media professionals should be uh, should decide. This is uh, after our experience. This is one of the most important aspects that we should we, we can uh, uh, communicate with you. And this is uh, is also important uh, the explicability. The people working uh, for the uh, in this field needs to understand how, why an artificial intelligence system uh, or a big data system uh, suggests, uh, communicate, or do something. They would like to know exactly what is the, the problem. <coughs> there is some warning. It's not possible to do something and just say, look at this because there can be some dangerous. This is not enough. So we need to do, uh, and this is uh, also in line with the ethical guideline of the European Commission about using artificial intelligence. After three years, uh, we discovered that this is uh, also in this uh, domain, this is absolutely true. And the last uh, comment, uh, so then we can pass the floor to Silvia, that which are the first panel, is that this is a very interdisciplinary problem. And we need to have synergy with, with different, many different backgrounds. In this event, uh, you will see an example of this because the first panel will be about uh, policies and institutions, and we will uh, uh, face uh, more this aspect. The second panel will be about technology, a scientific aspect uh, in uh, fighting this information. And this is absolutely important. We will have a wonderful speaker there. At, at the end of this uh, morning, we will have the final panel that will be about uh, business, because this can be also a business value added uh, in, uh, in, uh, in some way. And the, uh, the panel would be uh, very startups and uh, SME oriented, because we think that this is an opportunity for them. And so you will see that uh, at least we have policies, we have technologies, uh, and we have business. But there are also other aspects that we cannot cover in this event, but are very important. Just to mention two, legal and law. This is a, a big problem. Uh, Naturally, is not my field. My, uh, my uh, background is about artificial intelligence, but I consider this very, very important and very uh, it, 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 it very challenging, very complicated. And uh, I would like to mention another fundamental aspect that is the education, the training, the media literacy. We are not uh, in Fandango, this is not uh, the, the goal of Fandango, but we consider, I consider it personally and 
the team working in Fandango is very important. I know that the European Commission is doing a lot about this and I, I'm very I'm very happy. So you, you will see there is many different backgrounds and, uh, and this is something that is very uh, complicated some way but it's very interesting in the same time. So we will see this morning uh, some of this uh, of this aspect, uh, and uh, I hope that you will uh, enjoy this event. So I will pass the floor to Silvia, that will uh, chair the first panel, that will be about policies, uh, institution, and we will uh, understand what is the status uh, in, Bra in Brussels, but not, not only in Brussels, about this aspect. Thank you, Francesco. Good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to moderate uh, this first section. We have a very relevant speakers here. This is, before going to detail to the section, I would like to give you some technical details. So this event will be re recorded, so you will have the opportunity to look at, to watch at it also after the event. You, call, you can also promote uh, this event to be watched after. So we have a lot of uh, registered people, more than 140. So this means that there is a lot of interest in this kind of uh, topic. This information we know that is a real, a real important issue that affects all the sectors, so not only the media, but uh, all the information uh, can influence every sector starting from society, starting from policy. We have had also experience also during this COVID uh, pandemic that a lot of information uh, flows and uh, some of them were not so trusted, so not so true. So it is important uh, for the, the, the media professional uh, to be sure that the information is going to provide is a trusted information and uh, also the citizens has to be sure that what the information you received is something you can trust and uh, this uh, if you want uh, to ask questions uh, you can use the questions tab in your left bar and uh, the question will be asked uh, after the panel. So all the panels will, will have their talk, so you will have the opportunity to collect all the questions. And you have also the possibility to jump on the stage and ask directly the questions to the speakers. Saying that, uh, I go to present uh, this uh, panel, this panel that will talk about the European um, uh, policy framework, the European strategies on disinformation. Then we have uh, a very important example of a project uh, that uh, can tell us uh, what they are doing uh, and uh, uh, how they are going to collect all the stakeholders uh, that are needed uh, in order to have uh, a multidisciplinary teams, but also to have the right stakeholders uh, in order to create the, media, the digital media observatories. Now, the first uh, speaker, I have the pleasure to present uh, Paolo Cesarini. Paolo Cesarini is an expert in EU media policies, in digital single market issues, and the EU compliance uh, competition law. As you all know, Paolo is a, the former head of media convention social media uh, at the European Commission at the DG Connect. He led, uh, he, I have to say, is uh, a very key person uh, for this information because uh, he led uh, the initiatives of the uh, high level group on fake news. And uh, he chaired also the multi stakeholder forum that led uh, to the adoption uh, in the 2018 of the code of practice on this information. Paolo, I leave you the floor. Thank you, uh, Silvia, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, let me start by underlining the importance and the good work done uh, by the Project Fangitango during the last uh, three years or, or so. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, not only the contribution that the project has given to the uh, 
uh, to the use of data and AI applications to identify uh, potentially false information across media uh, social media platforms uh, and to analyze, very importantly, the propagation patterns of this information online, but also I'd like to praise the efforts made by Fandango uh, in joining the dots, so to speak. Uh, by creating links with other entities that support uh, data-driven and investigative journalism. So I am very honored today to, uh, to you to intervene at this conference, uh, and which gives me the opportunity to make some comments on, uh, on the last initiatives of the Commission. And here I refer in particular to the wide range of measures, uh, uh, which I would call the information package, that the Commission adopted last uh, uh, December. Uh, an, an initiative, let's say, a, a, a package of initiatives that gives a new impetus, in my view, to the political goal to, of countering this information online. Uh, the, uh, there are three main texts uh, that have been adopted just uh, for the background of the last December. It is the Digital Service Act, it is the European Democracy Action Plan, and very important also the uh, media and audiovisual action plan. Uh, there are, I would say, five main thematic uh, lines of action that emerge from this text. The first, it is certainly the role of the platforms uh, and the need to strengthen the responsibility, the social, corporate responsibility uh, that uh, like platforms have in the current uh, digital uh, informational uh, space. The second is about election integrity. As you know, the uh, elections are a uh, classic target uh, of uh, disinformation, and I think I don't need to insist on the most recent examples uh, provided by the US elections a few months ago. Uh, the, the, the third area is uh, um, the need to strengthen our diplomatic toolbox uh, to counter foreign uh, interferences. Uh, in addition, there is the, que the other question regarding media independence and pluralism that are very much at the core of the uh, European Digital uh, um, Democracy Action Plan. And last but not least, I would say they need to set up an integrated industrial policy for news media in light of the difficult situation that many outlets in the news sector are encountering today. I'm sure that uh, Alberto and Paola, after me, will touch upon some of these aspects. And uh, from my side, I would like to share with you today some reflections uh, regarding in particular two issues that I found uh, crucial in the current debate. The first is the creation of a co-regulatory framework that is designed to set out uh, appropriate uh, due diligence obligations uh, for platforms. And the second one it is about the need to complement uh, this regulatory intervention with dedicated policy tools that includes well-targeted investment programs uh, to support the news media sector and the digital investigative journalism. So let me uh, say a few things, and I must say I can speak quite freely now that I do not have the commission hat anymore. Uh, so um, the, let me start with the DSA. Uh, uh, the DSA, you know, it is in essence uh, an update of the uh, e-commerce directive. Uh, and uh, as the current proposal stands, it doesn't diverge from the basic tenets of the uh, e-commerce uh, uh, law. Uh, which uh, confirm the uh, principle of the limited or conditional liability for platforms, the absence of general monitoring obligations, and introduce also a good Samaritan clause that should incentivize uh, the platforms to do more in terms of uh, identifying proactively both illegal and harmful content on their, on their services. Um, I think the architecture of the DSA is uh, solid and includes also uh, provisions uh, to tackle harmful content, in particular disinformation. And uh, it does so by establishing 
a combination of uh, tools, let's say, that includes a limited set of due diligence obligations, a legal basis uh, for uh, self-regulation, so a legal basis for the code of practice on this information, inter alia, and an independent and quite robust, I'll say, public scr uh, scrutiny mechanism and oversight. Uh, it's very important to focus at this, at this stage, in my view, on the uh, due diligence obligation that are uh, provided for under the DSA. Uh, those are of three, um, three categories. I would put three categories around this concept. The first, it is the uh, concept of um, self-assessment of systemic risks that has been introduced for the first time and uh, concerns uh, uh, several things, by the way, not only uh, harmful contents, uh, the, this uh, need for platforms to self-assess on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, the, uh, the, the systemic risks that uh, emerge from their services, uh, concerns the legal content, concerns the need to protect uh, fundamental rights, so to avoid uh, over-removals for instance, when weeding out uh, illegal content from the services, but also concern a third category, which is defined as uh, intentional manipulation of the services of the platform service uh, through uh, inauthentic use or uh, automatic exploitation of the services. The second aspect, it is about transparency of recommender system. That is a very important thing because touch upon the way algorithms are understood by users and the way they work uh, with the particular rules that uh, would enable and empower the user to exclude profiling uh, uh, mechanism from the uh, recommender, from the use of their recommender systems. And thirdly, this there is the issue about transparency of online advertising, which of course include also political advertising. Let me say a few, let, let me make uh, um, some, a couple of critical remarks uh, in this respect. The first is that, in my view, the definition of systemic risks uh, given so far and subject to the future, of course, uh, uh, legislative debate in front of the Council and at the Parliament, which may reconsider this aspect, the current definition of systemic risks is too narrow. In authentic use and automatic exploitation of the services is, uh, is clearly one of the aspects that affect the integrity of platform services. Uh, that, of course, captures the use of uh, um, malicious bots, the uh, use of fake accounts, the use of stolen identities, account takeovers, uh, as well as you know, uh, purchases uh, on the black market of uh, fake engagements. So these are quite clear cut cases. And also the work that Fandango has done around, for instance, the identification of bots, uh, uh, it is uh, clearly relevant for this type of uh, new obligations that will occur on the, uh, for, the, um, for platforms. But I think the uh, challenge to tackle this information, which is very complex, as has been said before by Francesco as well, goes beyond that. Uh, there are many disinformation campaigns uh, that do not necessarily entail an artificial use or uh, automatic exploitation of the service, but rather a strategic use of these services and manipulations can happen uh, within, but also outside uh, uh, the, uh, the scope of the service provided by individual platforms and may exploit external online resources in order to boost certain narratives that then proves to be quite dangerous for democracy and for the good perception that citizens should have about uh, the state of uh, uh, general affairs. Um, these, these techniques are, I think, more and more known nowadays. Uh, attention hacking and information laundering are categories that are very, very important. Uh, the layering of uh, false information across the spectrum of online resources through proxy platforms and other systems by connecting online communities together around a strategic uh, goal to boost a, a specific theme or a specific a piece of fake information are clear examples that are well documented and which are become even more clear after the experience made during the COVID pandemic and during the election in the US uh, lately. 
the use of cyber troops and therefore these forms of state-driven propaganda that uh, involve humans and not necessarily bots or automated uh, tools uh, are also not to be forgotten. Uh, the organic virality of uh, 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 this information is also key. I mean, uh, the, uh, Trump has given us a beautiful example of how uh, an influencer and in this case, uh, the President of the United States can actually operate uh, uh, throughout the spectrum of uh, platforms, uh, uh, in particular the main one, Twitter, Facebook, etc., in order to capture the uh, very vast audiences without having resort to uh, uh, artificial uh, manipulations. And then, as a result of it, there is also this new aspect that it is the cross-platform migrations with communities that move from one platform to another platform, which uh, suggest uh, that by focusing the concept of systemic risk on a platform by platform basis, one may lose sight of the dynamics that links the different uh, platforms uh, and make a, co a, a joint use of different platforms, a strategic tool in itself by my, uh, at the disposal of my issues actors. So um, that is the first point. The second element of criticism, I'll say that uh, uh, is the need to think about stronger detection mechanisms. Uh, for the moment, I mean, the whole system in the DSA relies on self-assessments uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, self-discipline by platforms. Uh, um, I think we need to think about the role of fact-checkers, of NGOs, of users as well, in terms of flagging or in terms of issuing alerts about uh, uh, detected uh, uh, campaigns, uh, uh, disinformation campaigns, and very importantly, you have just mentioned it before, uh, uh, Silvia, it is the problem of uh, access to data for the platforms, because without that, we don't go much uh, very far. Now, uh, Article 31 in the proposal of the DSA indeed provides for access to data, but it is a quite cumbersome mechanism that starts with the request by, uh, by the uh, a regulatory authority, probably uh, the Irish authority will be in the, in the, the front runner in this case, but doesn't uh, uh, provide for a direct access by vetted researchers and other actors uh, that study the phenomenon of disinformation without going through uh, uh, this kind of bureaucratic uh, path. So they need to think about other uh, mechanisms, uh, probably based on GDPR, Article 40, which it, it sounds like uh, a, promises, a promising uh, path uh, uh, forward in order to ensure direct access to uh, researchers to uh, platforms data. And here I think that there is a role for Edmo, and I will stop there because Paola is nodding, but it will also probably tell us more uh, about that uh, in the, her intervention. The third aspect, it is uh, concerning the uh, risk mitigation measures that the platforms are supposed to put in place. I mean, there is not much clarity for the moment in the text of the DSA, and certainly that it is the role that the new code of practice should fulfill. And there are uh, several areas, several aspects that we'll mention in very general terms that needs to be catered for. First, it is the criteria for content moderation, the principle of proportionality, which goes from the takedown to other softer forms of identification and alerts for consumer awareness purposes, uh, needs to be considered and well calibrated in function of the type of techniques that is used in order to distribute this information online. Second, uh, it is important to reflect about this concept of responsible algorithmic design, where uh, auditing is very good. Auditing of algorithms is very good. Create transparency is very good, but algorithms should also uh, serve a, per a public uh, uh, interest purpose, which is to surface quality information. And that is uh, linked to the debate around trustworthiness indicators and the need to establish a system which is transparent and competitive for, uh, for uh, giving the users the maximum opportunities uh, to select these uh, uh, options in the, uh, in the recommender systems that enable the selection and the visibility of authoritative sources of information. And finally, importantly, is demonetization. Demonetization is still a battle which has stopped a bit half away with the, uh, with the DSA. The DSA looks at uh, 
the placement of ads on the platforms online interfaces themselves but doesn't take too much into account the placement of ads on third party websites and that again something that uh, uh, i think is very much in the radar screen of etmo and as well as other ngos that's like gdi like newsguard that looks at the spectrum of websites by looking at what are um, potentially undesirable landing pages for ads and all this needs also to be uh, uh, and i think about the code of practice the future code of practice needs to be strengthened from the point of view of its uh, 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 monitoring so the kpis the definition of the kpis uh, needs to be really seriously considered and again i stop there because alberto will certainly talk about that uh, in in a moment and i would like to conclude uh, silvia with, before you send me a message uh, recalling me that my time is coming to an end uh, <laughs> i would like to conclude on the second point very quickly the the importance of the media and audiovisual action plan that is crucial we can fight this information we can boost the tools we can make incredible progresses in uh, through the use of data and artificial intelligence to better detect phenomena that are driven by malicious intent and with the objective of uh, confusing people uh, but uh, uh, all this will be for nothing is if at the same time there are not uh, uh, enough resources to support uh, this uh, ailing sector, which is the news media sector, both in the broadcasting uh, side of it and in the, I would say, print side, also the print may be misleading, in the news media side, let's say, uh, uh, of the sector. Well, um, it is important in my view at this point uh, to extract from this very rich uh, action plan what are the relevant topics uh, for news media to extract and to identify a set and an integrate and to apprehend this industrial policy for news media in an integrated fashion for the moment there is a lot of it as there had been and i can and i have experience on my own skin i'll say uh, the a lot of initiative lot of good initiative but a little bit scattered out, out uh, using different funding stream without a, an overall narrative i think it would be important to build up an overall narrative that shows the determination of the Commission to support uh, uh, this sector uh, for the future, which is so key to, uh, for democracy, which is basically the infrastructure of democracy. Well, I will stop there and uh, happy to continue with question answers after the other interventions. Thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, your presentation is really interesting, and I think uh, some questions will rise uh, on what you have explained. Now I pass the floor to Alberto. Alberto is the scientific, scientific program officer of the DG Connect, and it, he is a, a team leader at the European Commission Directorate Gener General communication network uh, and uh, is involved Alberto is involved in designing and implementing the European Commission policy to tackle online disinformation prior to joining the commission Alberto was a researcher a science uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies Alberto I leave you the floor and uh, thanks uh, again you're mute, uh, Alberto. You're yes, mute. Of, co of course. But <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's early in the morning. Eh? This workshop starts, started quite early, so <laughs> I'm excused. Um, uh, thank you very much, Silvia, and, and thank you for invite me, uh, inviting me to this, uh, to this event, to the final event of Fandango. You know, we have been in touch uh, through these uh, three years. I remember the first, uh, the first meeting where we participated. It was the very beginning of our journey, I would say, on, uh, on disinformation, to tackle disinformation. And I think the project at that time was showing the need, you know, to move uh, in in different direction on on a, on a more uh, speaking and this is what also paolo already kind of introduced you now talking about the dsa and the co-regulatory framework that the dsa will kind of uh, put in place 
but also the need of moving, of, of doing something, of supporting activities from the research and innovation side. So I would like to structure my, my intervention touching on these two elements because I think also the audience of this event is also interesting to know what is coming up in the future regarding the support to the, to the scientific community, let's say. So as, as Paolo already mentioned, you know, uh, the, the recent pandemic, uh, the, 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 the events after the US presidential ele election shown that, you know, the, the disinformation phenomenon, the misinformation phenomenon, because it's not only disinformation, the problem is not only the intentional uh, 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 malicious activity that are a problem, but also uh, during the pandemic, we saw how the false information that is, is shared without a malicious intent can be also very dangerous for the health of the citizens. Are These are two major threats to our society, to, to not only to the democracy uh, that is uh, behind the functioning of our society, but also really for our well-being and, and for our health. So we need to, to step up our effort to, to tackle this problem. And of course, the DSA is the DSA proposal, which is still a proposal, is creating, you know, the, the, the overarching regulatory framework. But of course, uh, it will take some time for the DSA to be uh, approved. You know, it will have, it is going through the co-legislative uh, mechanism. So uh, it's, it, it will take a couple of years at least uh, to, to get finalized. So meanwhile, we cannot... Uh, idle and waiting for the DSA we need uh, to uh, you know continue our work uh, uh, and uh, this is what we are doing now uh, you know the European democracy action plan give to the commission the uh, the task of uh, um, writing a guidance for the signatory of the code and also for new signatory to strengthen the code of practice on this information, which was signed uh, back in 2018. So the code was a uh, premiere uh, worldwide. And it has been, I think, uh, a very good experience because it was, we learn a lot through the code, through the implementation of the code, through the monetary of the code. You know, we really have, uh, we, we are really, have now a, a very clear picture of what is needed, what are the shortcomings of this code, and how this shortcoming can be addressed. So starting from all the work that we have done so far, we are now drafting the, 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 the code of practice. Uh, the, sorry, the guidance to strengthen the code of practice. Let, let me say that, uh, uh, as I said before, the DSA will take a while, but the idea is that this guidance will be as a bridge towards the code of practice, the, the, the DSA. And this bridge, during this time, we will have uh, a, a new code of practice that uh, will aim to become one of the code of conduct that are foreseen under Article 34 of the Digital Services Act. So it will be one leg of the core regulatory framework uh, created by the Digital Services Act. And um, Paolo already uh, mentioned what are the areas that need to be tackled by the, the, the guidance and by the strengthened code of practice. We certainly need to have commitments to reinforce the integrity of online services and to address, you know, what uh, the DSA calls a manipulative behavior. And uh, so we need, uh, and we recently have a quite a broad stakeholder dialogue uh, on, on the different aspects of, of the code and how the stakeholder uh, see the, 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 the shortcoming and how we could address them and certainly this, the, 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 the code will need to be updated in order, you know, to take into consideration emerging uh, a manipulative behavior based, for instance, on deep fakes, to say one. But there are many other behavior, and we are sure that new technology will also, you know, allow for a new uh, strategy to, to, to spread this information. So the code should be, needs to be 
flexible and stand ready to take all these uh, uh, upcoming uh, uh, new strategy to, to spread this information. And of course, whenever these strategies, uh, the, whenever the signatory do something to tackle this, uh, these problems, they need to be transparent. We need to have more information on what the poli what they, their policy foresee to tackle this problem and how they implement the policy. So these are uh, uh, important aspects. And of course, another relevant aspect is empower user. You know, so far their platform have done something, yes, but this is not enough. The flagging mechanism for this information content are not uh, always so easy to be used by the average user, let's say. And they are also very different across platforms. So we need to do something on this. And of course, uh, the content uh, need to be the disinformation. The content that is being fact checked as false by, by independent fact checker needs to be clearly labeled. And and this and and and, and the people that knows uh, that kind of you know flag this possible content, this uh, piece of content as a possible piece of disinformation should basically know you know what what happened what when after they have flagged, flagged this content this came out clear from this uh, public uh, multi-stakeholder discussion that we had and uh, of course uh, you know that was clear already in the assessment of last september we need to do also something regarding monetization because there is a still a lot of ads that um, allows the monetization of this information that appears in website that uh, um, uh, spread this information. So I think, I think it's also in the interest of the advertiser to do something more. They are moving. There are already signals that they are doing something, but we sh the code should support their wishes of not funding this information. Then there is the issue regarding transparency of political and issue-based advertising. This is it's a complicated matter. There is also a, 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 an upcoming uh, legislative proposal on this, so the code will need to adapt also to this new legislative proposal. And last but not least, uh, there is the issue of access to data. And this is uh, for research purposes. This is a fundamental short issue. It's a sh long lasting shortcoming. We will need uh, the code, the strength and code to do uh, something about uh, to create, you know, a framework where the researchers can have access through which the researchers can have access to all the relevant data that they need, you know, to see where the disinformation come from, what are the strategies that are used uh, to, 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 to spread this information. So that's very important, very, very important. And uh, also, we will need a co cooperation framework with fact checkers and researchers that allows, you know, an open participation to this uh, to this cooperation with the platform. So far, there are only uh, signatory of the code have been a little bit cherry picking with whom they want to cooperate, and this is not healthy because it does not really support the growth of a multidisciplinary ecosystem ecosystem that take that can take on the problem of disinformation and paolo mentioned the monitoring the kpis this is uh, fundamental of course to assess the uh, impact the implementation of the code and to see and you know to make a comparison across also the signatory how they are performing when they are implementing the code but we also need to monitor what is the impact of the code overall on the problem of disinformation so this is very challenging i would say we will need probably here the support of 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 the of the communities but uh, that's something that uh, needs to be to be done that's already mentioned in the assessment that we have done uh, last september i was saying this i would say that this concludes a little bit the 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 the, the, mm, uh, the policies the strictly speaking policy part i would now go a little bit more on the on the research uh, 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 support for research and innovation horizon europe is going to be soon adopted by the uh, by the commission i'm sure that our uh, people call, uh, that are connected today have already seen 
uh, the, 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 the initial draft of, of, the, of the program. There are several initiatives that you know, will support uh, the, the media ecosystem, but there will be a specific initiative on the, uh, um, that will look to uh, research and innovation project that will uh, use artificial intelligence to, uh, you know, uh, to support the fight against disinformation. So to develop tools and services, new tools and services that can keep up <clears throat> with the technological development that allows also malicious actors to uh, um, build uh, uh disinformation strategies that are more and more sophisticated so we need to uh, support uh, you know the the fact checker the journalist uh, but in general the media industry with by developing tools that they can use to to you know to to check if content that they are using for their uh, articles is false or not is credible or not is based on facts or not. So, and this is linked very much to the work that Fandango has done. You know, Fandango uh, opened a little bit, was a pioneer in this in this area, but we want to put uh, more funding on this. And I think that will, 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 will happen in the future. To conclude, because I think my 15 minutes are almost at the end, uh, Edmo, Paula will give you the details of Edmo, but Edmo is an ambitious project, you know, to build an observatory that, uh, you know, observe the digital media ecosystem in Europe. So far, we have the central platform of, of Edmo, uh, Paula will tell you about it. In the summer, we will have the first national hubs that will be connected through it, to the uh, uh and through the central platform and through the central platform will cooperate together and and the, the national hubs will really do the the the, the uh, groundwork so they will detect analyze and expose this information that happens at member state level they will have media literacy activity and they will support also national authorities in monitoring you know what the platform are doing uh, regarding this information. So that's a project that we started a year ago almost, uh, and uh, it will continue. We are also, uh, you know, uh, almost done also with the Digital Euro program, and there we will have also further uh, support for, for Edmo and for the and for the national hubs in order, you know, to have a full coverage of, of the EU territory. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for listening. And I'm ready then to go more, more in the details uh, if needed uh, with uh, with a question and a time. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, now we go for the last uh, talk. Uh, but uh, as Alberto announced, uh, it uh, is related to the Edmo project. Uh, Paola Gori is the Secretary General and Project Manager Leader of the European Digital Media Observatories. And um, <clears throat> these observatories brings together fact checkers and academic researchers with the experts in the field of online disinformation. And it also supports public authorities in assessing the implementation of the EU code of practice on this information. So as Alberto said, this is the project that in some way collects all the issues that has been presented before by Alberto and uh, Paolo. So Paola, please, the floor is yours. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure being here and it's actually a pleasure presenting Edmo after a presentation of Paolo and Alberto. I will show a brief presentation online on the screen as well. I think it could help actually in understanding uh, if I manage actually because, all right, let me see if I manage to do that. I think you see it now, correct? <laughs> 
So actually, um, let me just say that um, there are key words that were mentioned uh, by Francesco in the, in the introduction and also by Alberto and, and Paolo, such as we need data, uh, uh, Francesco was saying, we need an interdisciplinary approach, uh, we have to have a focus on education, and then the code was mentioned, of course, and the researchers, the fact checkers, the access to the data. So I hope with this presentation you can understand what Edmo is doing and you can also understand how much Edmo is actually key in this, precisely because of what was mentioned before. So very briefly, Edmo is a consortium. We are funded by the European Commission. It is led by the European University Institute in Florence and the other partners are Arus University, Athens Technology Center and Pagella Politica. So you already see from the consortium that the multi-stakeholder element and multidisciplinary element is in there. Um, very briefly, EDMO is an independent observatory. Uh, we are a digital service infrastructure. This means that basically we are acting as a hub, as a community builder to put together um, stakeholders in, in the field, but also we are a body of facts and evidence, which means that we're also collecting any evidence in any data that is needed to tackle online disinformation. Uh, this is because we all know that what is important when fighting online disinformation is to have an analysis of the actors, the vectors, the tools, the methods, uh, the targets and the impacts on society of online disinformation. And as it was mentioned by Alberto as well, uh, Edmo will work with national or multinational hubs uh, uh, throughout the member state and we will also collaborate with pilot projects that were selected from this small scale online media uh, call from the commission. Uh, just to give you a context of why EDMO and where it comes from, you may remember the communication on tackling online disinformation, a European approach of 2018. And there was a need mentioned there of an effective response requires a solid body of facts and evidence on the spread of disinformation and its impact. And the same communication was saying additional data gathering and analysis by fact checkers and academic researchers should include the following activities monitoring the scale techniques and tools, uh, identifying and mapping this information mechanism, uh, contributing to the development of fair, objective and reliable indicators for source transparency, sharing knowledge, and providing better access to online platforms data and a secure space to analyze and exchange information. So this is how we ended up in EDMO and creating EDMO and having these famous five pillars of EDMO. The first one is the setup of secure online collaborative platforms for fact checkers and for researchers. You will actually see the opening of the platform for fact checkers very soon on the EDMO website. Um, and we also have the EDMO portal in which any, uh, let's say, action and activity of EDMO is promoted and accessible. Uh, we have a governance body that ensures the public trust regarding our work. It is composed by an, an executive board and an advisory board. And one of the main tasks is actually exactly to establish a framework to provide secure access to data uh, of the online platform for research purposes. And considering, I mean, I, if I had to choose a focus for today on our activity, I, had, I, I would have chosen actually this, and this is why we would see that in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a while more in detail. Um, then we are supporting and facilitating the coordination of independent fact-checking activities in Europe. We, for example, uh, recently pu published a map of the fact-checking uh, initiatives in Europe, and we will soon have searchable directories that aggregate fact-checks and media literacy material from external repositories, but also actually from um, some from the uh, items that will be published on, on the secure online platform. The same is happening for research. So we are we will soon um, publish a repository of the academic research activities on online disinformation in Europe. And the idea there is, again, to go back to what Francesco was saying, to keep the interdisciplinary element uh, in, in mind and so to have a, a, a scientific overview in the various uh, fields, relevant fields. And, as it was mentioned also by Alberto, provide academic input and methodological support to the authorities and in general to uh, the policies in the sector, of course, uh, uh, the analysis of the code of practice, as well as the famous need of KPIs or to further analyze the concept of trustworthiness are part of our work. 
Uh, to briefly, very briefly go back to what was mentioned before, the idea how to build this famous framework to access the data for research purposes. So in November uh, last year, we opened a call for comment on Article GDP, uh, 40 of the GDPR. And because the idea is that we would like to set a working group precisely to on the access of the data for uh, purposes of social scientific research. Uh, this is why, I mean, how are we doing that? So on which basis? Um, basically, the, the GDPR provides a special, let's say, more permissive regime for the processing of personal data for scientific research. This was also acknowledged by the European Data Protection um, Supervisor and uh, who actually acknowledged the value of scientific research for democratic society. And so on the basis of Article 40, stakeholders can develop a code of conduct that lays out how actually the GDPR can be put into practice in specific, practical and precise manner and establish, of course, a monitoring body to oversee the implementation of, of the code. Um, so what we are doing now, we did this call, we received a lot of comments. It was very, really, really a, a surprise, <laughs> probably not considering the need of this access. And we are now setting this working group which will be composed by, uh, of course, experts uh, in the legal field and experts in the sector. And they will hopefully publish a code of conduct that could be actually the basis to build this framework to access the data of the platform for research purposes. Um, Alberto already mentioned that, so probably uh, no need to mention too much here. But uh, what I wanted to say is that the role of the national and multinational hubs will be actually key for Edmo. I'm saying that because we are acting as a central platform, but uh, in order to make sure that, I mean, that all the relevant uh, stakeholders are involved, as well as the evidence, we need actually uh, help from the members at a member state level. We need information coming from there, and they will be key actually in collecting that information and then in feeding the, the Edmo platform. I'm not going through again the, the actions because uh, Alberto already mentioned that, so no, no need for me to, to mention them again. And very briefly, uh, what, how are we doing all that? Uh, we are organizing conferences and workshops and overall policy dialogues. We are uh, being involved in overall in the policy debates in the sector policy analysis, we are publishing reports. We recently also published a report based uh, on a survey we launched uh, among fact checkers on COVID-19 and vaccination campaigns. We are organizing trainings and actually I'm happy to say that the first training will take place on the 11th and 12th of May and this will be on the ABC of fact checking. Um, we will, once the framework will be established, hopefully call, open the call for research projects to access those data. Uh, the coordination of the activities at member states level was already mentioned, the platform, the secure platform as well, maps and repositories. We would like to open a podcast series, we have a newsletter and of course we are on social media. So as you, as you see, we are really acting as a a platform bringing together on one side uh, stakeholders, on the other side uh, collecting the information that is needed, the evidence. And um, by doing that, we have the, uh, the famous uh, interdisciplinary approach. So really, we really need think that you need experts from the various sectors. And this doesn't only mean the legal experts or the economic ones, we need experts in neurosciences, in social, in all the social sciences, in sociology, anthropology. I mean, this is the only way to actually understand the phenomenon. We need engineers. I mean, we really need the experts in the whole chain uh, to tackle online disinformation. I hope I was clear enough. I'm trying now to exactly to stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to reply to your questions. Thank to you, Paula. I have just a question for you, just uh, exactly in your slide. Uh, what do you think is, is the role of the societies, of the cities in, in this uh, multidisciplinary uh, context? I mean, they have a key role, and that's why Edmo is also like uh, involving uh, civil society organizations. I mean, uh, citizens are probably those who, on one side, uh, are those who need, uh, still need some media literacy to actually be able to understand if a certain uh, post or a certain content is actually reliable or not, understanding the sources, understanding how to detect. detect. Uh, on the other side, I mean, uh, 
we don't they, they don't need to, to to lose trust in media in in, the, in in as well and in institutions so they are on one side probably the the victims but on the other side they have the active role actually in in this fight against online disinformation yeah i completely agree i think that uh, the most important things because this information is addressed to the societies so it's uh, the societies uh, as you said uh, is losing trust uh, on the information they do not know how what to believe because we know we have a lot of information different information from the same topic things like that so i think that one of the main challenges uh, is to in involve the citizens uh, in the loop uh, so they can also understand how it works how information is created and why they have to trust this information and all other information depends on the sources depends on the publishers depends on uh, all the context uh, because sometimes uh, this information is also, also relating to the context because one information <laughs> if you extract information for the context is completely false but then uh, if you uh, describe uh, in this content, how this information is true. This is something that uh, it's not so easy to educate uh, the societies in order to really understand what's happening uh, in uh, in uh, when the information is provided. Yeah. Let's not forget that societal resilience is at the heart of the whole policy here. So yes, of absolutely, course. absolutely. Then uh, another question, then I will pass to the ones uh, that are there. Relating to the data, all of you mentioned the data, the difficulties uh, in reaching the data, how is important to have the data, how is important to have data that can be interpreted. So, do you think that uh, within the European uh, regulation policies framework, there could be some policies uh, who should regulate uh, the data access, at least in Europe? So which is the, the, the work uh, that uh, is, has been done or is going to be done relating to the policies on accessibility of data? So on the Edmo side, as I was mentioning, we are working on what is already there, let's say. So we are working on this code of conduct of Article 40, the European Democracy Action Plan that I think was mentioned before. I mean, st stresses again the importance of accessing those data. Uh, on the further developments of the EU policy, I guess I have to leave it to Alberto. <laughs> um, uh, yes, uh, okay, yes, uh, of course, uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, the access to data um, and the use of the data is already regulated. And I think Europe is one of the most advanced, uh, have one of the most advanced legislation regarding uh, uh, the, the, the use of uh, of, uh, of of private data you know it's the famous gdpr um but of course uh, we we kind of we are in a situation where the platform are using the gdpr as a little bit sometime as an excuse of course there are risks uh, and the cambridge analytica case shows that you know giving open access to all the data can be very dangerous and can lead can lead to to bad consequences but you know, sometimes this GDPR is a little bit an alibi not to allow uh, sufficient research uh, based on data that is owned by the um, by the platform. And so this is an outstanding issue. And if we want to understand this information, we need to find a way for uh, uh, providing access to this data for research purposes this is what edmo is trying to do with 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 this code of practice uh, uh, code of conduct uh, under article 40 of the gdpr we will we, the commission already in the european democracy action plan said that gdpr is not a blocking uh, element for uh, uh, giving access uh, to data for research purposes. So that's that's already stated there. We need to find, uh, and with the code, I think, well, we'll try to do that. We need to find the right framework where uh, the not only the platform, but also the researchers are working together with the platform to identify uh, what are the requirements in terms of, of, of the of data and how this data can be delivered to the researchers. Let's also keep in mind that DSA yeah. has an article that uh, um, uh, foreseeing that 
researchers, vetted researchers, should have access to data in order to uh, uh, assess the risks that uh, are related to the services provided by the platform. So we will see how the, the regulation will develop. Maybe Paolo has something to say about it. Yes, uh, I can add something, and this is a, uh, indeed an important topic. Uh, and it's also a little bit of a catch-22 topic. Uh, regulating is uh, uh, good, but can have backlashes. If you regulate too much, then you create uh, uh, bottlenecks when the needs for data uh, change. So if, uh, you risk to, uh, you know, to constrain too much. Uh, into a specific framework, certain needs that can evolve over time. And I think the catch-22 side, it is about, it's about determining in the first place what are the needs. So uh, this is very much linked to the uh, debate around the KPIs. This is about, uh, this is linked to the need to identify how do we measure the relative performance of different platforms in assuming their own responsibility on one side, and how we track the phenomenon in its different facets and multiple methods of delivery of this information online. So how do, what are the data that enable a real 360 degrees view on the mechanism that shape the distribution of this information online? There are two different needs. We need to be very clear about the needs in the public interest uh, on these two fronts and then I think uh, there are uh, the, the regulatory uh, instruments are there. On the one side, there is Article 31, as uh, Alberto was mentioning, but Article 31 is for enforcement purposes. In order, it, uh, it only uh, enable an access to data in order to ascertain whether or not the platforms have been accomplishing, have been fulfilling their obligation under the DSA. It doesn't give us much. In, um, uh, in terms of, on the second front, of tracking the phenomenon as such. That's why the Article 40 GDPR uh, pathway and the Code of Conduct, it is a very necessary complement. But again, when it comes to uh, fears about uh, overstepping the line, the privacy line, uh, before getting in that debate, it's very, very, very important to fix both the public interest uh, at stake enforcement on one side, but also better view of the phenomenon and its mechanism on the other side, that then justified a legitimate request for access to data to uh, researchers, and, uh, and then the prerogatives for platforms uh, to adhere to certain standards to guarantee the privacy of the data will be a rather a more technical issue to be dealt with in terms of definition of data sets. Uh, but we need to crack this catch-22. We need to be clear about the needs that we have in terms of data. Sure. Here we have a question from the audience. And how can stakeholders get involved within Edmo? All right. So Edmo started talking to everybody basically from day one. Uh, the suggestion is to contact me. And, and uh, what we do usually is we start a bilateral conversation. We introduce better Edmo. We see where we can start uh, collaborating and then also see where, I mean, depending on the action of the stakeholder, uh, how this can actually be integrated in the activity of of Edmo. So I would suggest to get in contact with me. I can write my address here in the in the chat and and we take it from there. Uh, we are open for any really collaboration and, and and debate actually in the sector. Okay, thanks Francesco. Yeah. Do you have some I, I, questions? I would like again back to the data problem. I would like to ask uh, Paolo and Alberto about the media data space. Uh, we know that uh, there is this uh, new initiative in the, in the new world program. And so maybe this can be not solve the catch 22 problem, but maybe can be also supporting uh, us as a researcher, but the, the people in this, uh, in this problem. Uh, this, uh, I think this is a, a, a real good initiative that is linked uh, it's not just for media, but for media, maybe we have this uh, more, more 
possibility, and this is also linked to the Paolo mentioned also the taking apart uh, the taking aspect of, of change data. This is I know that this is linked also to Gaia X. So we see a lot of uh, of uh, possible synergies. So I would like to know from from you if what you think of, or if you can give more uh, indication about this the media data space. I think Alberto should go. Yes, I will go first. Um, uh, so uh, yes, you know this was announced uh, in the in the media in the um, uh, in the in the map uh, in the, in the media and our visual action plan, and uh, and uh, this is certainly a, an important initiative because you know it's it's uh, many years that we are war talking about the importance of data for the media industry of course data is important for any industry uh, nowadays but certainly uh, if, if if we want uh, that uh, you know more more traditional uh, media players uh, um, evolve and become more you know competitive in the current uh, uh, market uh, we need uh, uh, to have a, a digital transition that goes through uh, fund uh, um, that is based on the on, on the possibility to use data sets and and uh, it's 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 full of example of course and uh, and i think uh, the, the idea of of what we 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 are planning to do is to provide you know to deploy an infrastructure so there will be uh, this will be an exercise where public funding and private funding will go together for the creation of infrastructure that can support different sector within the media industry, not only the audiovisual sector, but also the news media sector. And uh, because it's probably where the news media sector is the sector that is probably, you know, uh, most in need because of all the issues related, you know, to, to to also to, to to advertisement, which is kind of you know nowadays uh, all the online ads are based on the data. If you don't have the data, you cannot pro provide with uh, with uh, an uh, with uh, 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 an efficient. Uh, um, um, you cannot have an efficient advertising network. So that's that's very very much important. And of course, uh, I, I believe uh, we will see in the future because there will be also an integration between, of course, the Digital Europe Program and the Horizon Europe Program. Because the idea is that once we have deployed this infrastructure, we will have new services and tools develop under Horizon Europe. So the infrastructure, the data infrastructure becomes a fantastic opportunity to test with the community, you know, with the final user, how these tools uh, can be integrated in the media uh, uh, value chain. So I think uh, that will be, I mean, of course, we wish to be successful. And if we will be successful in doing so, I think that will be a great opportunity. A great opportunity for the media sector uh, as a whole. Yeah, perhaps we have. Add... Sorry, go ahead, Paolo. Now, to add uh, one single thing, uh, there is a lot of expectation uh, I perceive uh, from the new, the news media sector around this uh, uh, flagship initiative. The data media spaces are seen as an opportunity for breaking certain silos uh, and moving the level of cooperation across medias to the next step. But still, there are uh, many challenges. There are technical challenges. So in the definition of the infrastructure for data relevant for media, there are technical challenges that uh, concerns the variety, the dishomogeneity of the data uh, that exists out there with different formats and different ways to uh, and difficulties in integrating in, uh, in uh, these data sets in a usable way uh, across different uh, uh, data holders. And there is another more commercial uh, issue, which is the, uh, the fear that I have sensed in the, uh, uh, in the media sector uh, for uh, diluting branding. <laughs> so we need to be, to be very clear about what this uh, data infrastructure, uh, which purpose it will serve. The purpose will be certainly de designed to create new platforms for quality content. That is the landing spot for this initiative. But uh, 
uh, in addition to the uh, challenges for the data infrastructure as such, we have to think about also the commercial resistance from the act in the uh, publishing side uh, to uh, maintain their brand image and visibility as outlets, as individual outlets. It is a bit of a square, it's a bit, uh, a bit of a, uh, an exercise of squaring the circle, if you want. Uh, which requires a lot of creativity in terms of what type of formats could be suitable for this uh, final landing yeah. slot, which is the platform for quality content in the future. If exactly. I may say, if I may add, sorry, Silvia, just an information yes. that I think it's 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 important for everybody. So, uh, what will be published uh, soon, once adopted, will be uh, the war program of Digital Europe. But the way Digital Europe will work uh, is that uh, there will be then specific call for for proposal so uh, uh from 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 when the 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 the, the work the um, digital euro program will will go live to the publication of the call for proposal related for instance to the to the digital media infrastructure uh, to the data uh, infrastructure for media there will be a phase of consultation with the stakeholder so uh, I invite uh, all the stakeholders to get in touch. Uh, we will organize a, a meeting with the stakeholders in order to, you know, to, to see what are the needs uh, that we need to address uh, in the call. Perfect. Thanks a lot. We have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, Francesco, you have another one? Or let's go do the priority to the audience. Uh, we are a little bit in delay, but I prefer to skip the break, but aim to go ahead with the with the question. So uh, here we have one uh, from Antonis Stramfos. These are the results of the study on media data space uh, gone public yet? I think I don't recall a study on media data space, but we have a study on a quality platform. Uh, um, that is not yet there. Uh, so if 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 uh, if the, the the question refers to that, is not yet there. Okay, perfect. Then uh, we have another one uh, from Kalina Boncheva, if I pronounce it well. Uh, is for Paula. Paula, from the We Verify H2020 project, we are very keen to collaborate and provide wide use tools for journalists and fact checkers. Over uh, 40k users uh, to the Edmo community. Are you the best person to talk to directly soon? Yes, so we will provide your. Uh, we have already provided the chat, your email address. So she, she can directly contact you. Another one from Antonia Gregori, and uh, I. It is in the end. Uh, aren't you afraid uh, Edmo becoming a sub 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 subcontractor for making data GDPR compliant instead of the flat platform and being responsible for labeling who is legitimate research and who is Cambridge Analytica? So Do I don't I don't understand no, the subcontractor no. part. Uh, uh, you're saying I, I guess the point is the platform should do that, uh, if I understand it correctly. So the platform should actually work on this code of conduct. Well, if that's the question, probably an independent uh, pool of experts and academics is the best uh, group to do that work. Uh, responsible for labeling who is legitimate research and who is Cambridge Analytica. So. Uh, once we have that code, of course, then there would be criteria that would be uh, vetted by the academic uh, community, of course, on who can, and the criteria on be, who can then access those data. So, of course, I mean, uh, this will be done in full cooperation with the whole academic community in order to make sure that we are not inventing something new and that we are aligned with the principles in research. And I think, if I may, I think uh, uh, you, you Paula, the, the overall idea of Edmo is really empowering the community and 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 giving the enough strength to face the platform, you know, 
to be able to have an interface that can uh, that uh, that through which uh, uh, the community can talk to the platform can can discuss with the platform what is needed uh, in in this respect. Mm. So another question for Paula. Uh, Paula, we have permanently results from media authorities to project against the illegal and harmful content, drug, weapons, etc especially to project minors would this also fit into your platform so edmo is not focusing on the illegal content so we are focusing on online disinformation so far so i guess uh, it depends on, on on the work done but uh, our main focus is online disinformation not illegal content okay perfect i think that now we are out of time uh, and uh, I would really like to thank all of you. Your presentation has been really useful. I think you have covered all the most part uh, relating uh, the work that you are doing in terms of strategies, uh, your regulations uh, and uh, the Edmo project that is one of the main uh, projects uh, that uh, is deals uh, with, uh, with, uh, with these topics. And uh, so I now I think uh, we can give the floor to the second panelist. And let's have just uh, five minutes break. But I see that he have a, that is the moderator of the next panel is already there. And uh, I thank all of you again and talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Silvia. Um, well, uh, my name is Javier De Vega. Uh, I work for the Silvia Foundation. We are partners in, in the Fandango project. And in this second panel, we are going to talk about the uh, big data and quality data for fake news and disinformation uh, detection. Um, as you are all aware, uh, uh, discovering disinformation and misleading content uh, rapidly, effectively, and in real time is one of the most complex but most needed uh, challenges we are facing in the digital landscape in the European Union and globally. And we have an abundance of data. And we have many different sources of data from media organizations, from user-generated contents. We have millions of videos, millions of tweets, thousands of claims. And in this time, it's very difficult. We still have a partial view of this data. It's very difficult to filter, to discriminate, and to know what is false and what is intentionally wrong. Uh, so we have today uh, three great uh, panelists. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce. I will, I will, uh, they will all explain uh, very different approaches to, the, to this issue. And I will be introducing them uh, one by one. Uh, the first one, which is uh, taking the floor, is Massimo Magaldi. Massimo Magaldi is a senior researcher at the Digital Media and Energy Lab, if, I, if I'm right, at Engineering, Engineering Ingenieria Informatica, an Italian company. Uh, he's also Fandango's technical director, and he's going to present uh, Fandango's approach and its practical case. Uh, Massimo, uh, nice to uh, it's uh, nice for me to to give you the floor. Okay, uh, hi, good morning to everyone. I'm I just trying to uh, upload a, a presentation that I like to share with you. Um, I don't know if is it working or not because I lose the, the screenshot of the. Well, please let, give me just a minute because um, yeah, no, don't worry, yeah. I was uploading, but I don't know if it is working or not. Otherwise, I will go through the normal presentation. And um, okay, let's proceed in in, in this way. Um, let me share the the screen. Um, sorry, uh, let's see if it works in this way. Share screen. Hello. 
Bitcoin. It's not a matter of yeah, yeah. In the I story. think that now you're. Yeah. Can you see the presentation, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, as you say, we will uh, discuss briefly of the Fandango approach to the, the to the panel for this session panel uh, topic. Uh, we are talking about big data and the quality of data for fake news and disinformation detection. Um, just to, uh, okay, we got it. Um, briefly, Fandango project is a uh, age 2020 innovation action. Um, it was based on three pilots on the typical information scenario climate immigration in European context. Uh, and we are also uh, taking a look to the, of course, uh, COVID-19 situation, which is something that we will present for the final review of the project, you know, which is uh, next to, to be within a couple of months. And the main objective of the project was the automatic disinformation detection. This is the idea that we got at uh, the, the beginning. Of course, the, the mission of the, of the, the project was the work with big data and artificial intelligence against the disinformation. But how Fandango aims to tackle this information? Well, uh, basically, we provide online service to support media professional uh, with these uh, two um, kind of features. One is disinformation detection based on big data uh, analy um, um, analysis techniques, uh, mostly machine learning, deep learning, but also graph analysis, and providing trustworthiness score calculated uh, with these techniques. On the other side, we work through that investigation, uh, through an interactive explanation of the news, verified claims, so that we are considering the, the work of the uh, fact checker, open data, and uh, at, at the end, social media, Twitter, I, I will explain later on why I'm telling, saying at the end. Um, how can we support this information detection? This is, this is a tool that is, uh, that should be considered for a in, in user that um, in some way we want to um, simulate the way that uh, people should uh, operate to recognize a fake news. Uh, this is something that was provided by the uh, European Parliamentary Research Services. Uh, this is how to spot fake news. Uh, actually, it was, uh, as you are, I, I guess, made. Probably today, all of us are experts. I mean, also people uh, um, are experts about the way that you can spot fake news. You have to check the authors, you have to check the contents, you have to check the sources, but you have to check the video, the, the images. Um, you have to, to consider a, a lot of things. We, what we have addressed with the, our uh, machine learning based uh, trustworthiness score. Uh, we analyzed the text, the headline and body of the news, we analyzed the authors and sources, and then the publisher, and we analyzed the media uh, embedded into the, into the news, so uh, images and videos. On the other side, how we support that investigation? Well, actually, since we have the, this topic of this panel is about uh, data silos. Well, we're breaking down data silos with different data sources integration. So we uh, we collect from the from web news, crawling on website. We collect also claim review. We collect uh, open data, and at the end we have we collected also social media because, uh, as you know, there was some problem to get the assets to uh, social media data for the activity. Uh, on the other side, we are providing investigative tool powered by the Fandango data model that you can see here on the screen. So this is the way that we are uh, supporting the data investigation. Um, this is just a, 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 some screenshot uh, when, uh, when it's use case. If I wanted to check an article, for example, this is, a, uh, this is an article that I, I want to check within our system. Uh, I, we just put the URL into the, the check article uh, panel of the, of the Fandango platform, and we get this result. And you can, as you can see, probably is not <laughs> not so easy to, to see. By the way, uh, the the line in red uh, is the the short line in red is the uh, overall score provided by uh, our trustworthiness score, uh, so the analyzers uh, about this. Um, 
this uh, news. Uh, we get very low score about the, um, the text analysis, uh, um, not so not so lower for the name of the of the authors. Uh, very low score also for the publisher. Uh, actually, you can agree probably, but the authors in this case, the, there is this is a, an article without the name of the authors, so there, there is uh, it, it's. We consider as the authors the, the publisher in this case. Um, on the other hand, we can also uh, perform some kind of data investigation on the same news. Uh, the, the same uh, article, check article use case, provides also all the similar news that are, have been ingested by Fandango and processed by Fandango. For example, one of the first uh, um, article uh, coming up from the for the search uh, um, in, in search and activity within the platform was uh, just a fact checking of the, uh, um, the the article that we are considering. Um, it's a fact checking on something about the same topic. Let me see. And if we click on the first row, we can get to this, which is the uh, the article where we you have to do the banking of the of the. Of, the, of this news. Uh, this is just a, a, an example of the data investigation and uh, data uh, detection and uh, the, this information detection. This is another example. We can check an image. This is clearly a, a fake image, but as you can see, uh, we are um, checking an image and we get this several kind of uh, result coming from different uh, modality of uh, image um, analysis tool. Um, I just want to add something about this because at the beginning of the project, as I said before, the, the first idea of the project was to automatic uh, detection of this information, which is, uh, as we already said at the beginning, probably Francesco said at the beginning of this, uh, this uh, event, uh, the menace should be always in the loop. Uh, in our, in, within our, within our um, consortium, there are CBO, the ANSA, uh, VRT, which are uh, all uh, end user involved in the media. Uh, there, there is a news agency uh, broadcaster from coming from the from Belgium, and CBO also working on, on media. Um, they say uh, we we cannot uh, accept a system that uh, provides uh, an answer like an, an oracle. Well, we just want to be supported to recognize if something is false or true. Because, uh, as you already know, fake news detection is actually uh, still a, a, a very um, a very complicated task to uh, to, to to be to, to provide on the um, machine learning um, side. I, I mean, it's not easy to get a good result. By the way, at the beginning, we just, we, the first attempt, we just provide a score, a number, but uh, of course this was uh, not really understandable by the end user. Why are you saying to me that this image is fake at 18%, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fake image? But uh, then we get to design this other way to represent the, the, the result using the heat map. And in this way, it's more easier for everyone to recognize that uh, there is the images of uh, in, in the first, on the upper and left. Uh, it's very easy to recognize the red uh, heat map showing that the, the images was uh, manipulated and was uh, put into the for the shopping, let me see. Another tool to uh, uh, support that investigation is the image time timeline. So we get uh, at the image uh, using the, this tool, and we can recognize if the article, uh, this, if this is image was already uh, provided, published uh, before on internet, because uh, we know that uh, this is one of the typical uh, case, use case for uh, uh, for this information uh, using uh, an images uh, extracted from uh, from the past in another context and then put into uh, into the news today just to uh, to work on 
uh, on the emotional side of the, of the people looking at the news. Um, then another tool that we have to, the, to support that investigation is the Czech publisher. This is a screenshot of the uh, uh, dashboard that will support the, all the information to check by the publisher. You can see there are also a tweet on the left side and um, article on the right side. But uh, what is interesting is this, uh, that this is a detail, and we can see the, in the publisher graph, we can, we can see the name of the publisher before it's news. Uh, and uh, we can recognize the uh, relationship between, and we are able to uh, navigate through this information, of course. So we can click on all the article uh, created by this publisher or written by this author. This is an, another um, detail of this, where you can see the, the detail about the, the relationship between the authors, the uh, publisher, and all the, the article created in this case the this article created um, well uh, but this is a panel about the uh, uh, big data and data quality uh, issue actually that we that we uh, faced have faced during the, the the project one of these is the data gathering issues we are you already talking about the issues about the GDPR uh, and the privacy uh, issues, but there is also this kind of uh, issue actually, which is the uh, the term or services or the term of use infringement when you try to use crawler to scrape the web, uh, or uh, even if you are, even if you want to use uh, some services, you have to be aware of what can you do uh, with this, uh, this uh, data that, uh, for example, Common Crawl provides to you. So there is a term and use, and you have to check what can you really do with this data or not. Of course, there is uh, all the, all the aspects about the copyright that uh, can be violated. Now, uh, as someone has already said, another problem to uh, gather uh, social media data was the at one time in the past, uh, all social media uh, locked down their, their data. Uh, this title uh, explained very clearly that, that, it, that it was, this was really a big uh, disaster for, for the academic research because uh, we were not able to access the, the, the data of Facebook. Of course, we all know that in this period, uh, the new oil is data. So um, it's clear that uh, social media uh, try to, um, in some way, uh, don't uh, west they they reach richness, which is the, all the data that they they own. Uh, but something has changed because really in the in, in this last month, Twitter also probably also considering what happened with the disinformation with COVID-19, because I have to say the Twitter right now is the social media um, that has uh, the most important approach to uh, fight disinformation using labeling, and uh, they have also created a, another kind of activity to uh, call the bird watch, uh, if I remember right, um, to detect and to uh, fight this information. By the way, Twitter has decided to uh, open the new API version for the academic research, which is a really an interesting uh, um, uh, approach uh, in contrast with the, the approach of uh, Facebook. On the other side, we have also data quality issues. Well, um, we in the project, we, we, we have to define a to implement crawler, grabbing the crawling and scrapping data from the from the web. Uh, well, when you are when when you try to crawl data from a website, uh, it's really difficult to uh, guarantee data quality of the data you are crawling. There are the cookie policies, the paywall major messages. Uh, there are there it's there appears and. It's not easy to to clean those this uh, all this uh, data, 
uh, and actually the payable messages should be not uh, <laughs> um, we, we, we can't of course um, bypass the payable messages uh, uh, and we also have to um, respect the robotics uh, uh, guidelines and restriction provided from from each website when you crawl the, the site we also have problem to extract data once we add the raw data coming from the crawlers. For example, there is no standard metadata used for some. Uh, each site uh, has no, uh, quite often a custom template. And for example, if you are searching for a metadata like the publishing date, uh, sometimes you can reach this data because it's uh, they they don't follow. Uh, let's say the standard suggested also by by Google, for example, but uh, they use their own uh, own custom uh, template and metadata. On the on the other side, also there, there are low standard compliance. For example, uh, you know there there is the claim review, but uh, we know that uh, for example many fact checker sites uh, actually some fact checker sites don't respect the clean review schema uh, standard and so in this way we, we were not able to get uh, exactly the, the information that we need then there, there is also uh, issue about the uh, automatic topic modeling and clustering especially when you trying to have a multilingual approach as well as for the name entity recognition instruction for uh, also in the multimedia um, domain a multilingual domain sorry Another issue uh, is the the performance versus the explainability of the uh, model, the artificial intelligence model that we, we are using, deep learning, machine learning. As you can see, uh, right now, the, the higher are the accuracy, the lower are the explainability. How they address this into Fandango, for example? As I said before, at the beginning, we, are, we were providing just a number. Uh, for the image score, but then we move to uh, show an map, which is more easily understandable and uh, explain better what is the, 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 the manipulation uh, that the, the, the model recognizes on the images. On the same, in the same time for the video, we uh, show a square box uh, limiting the part of the video where you can see that there is probably some manipulation uh, for example for deep fake uh, actually and um, then for the text <coughs> we start using a stylometric features uh, based model uh, which actually provide a low performance respect with respect to the newest model that we are using based on transformers uh, BERT uh, or for example XLMR but um, it's not easy to understand why BERT say that uh, this news is fake or not while instead it's more easier for the user to recognize the stylometric features because they are very explainable yeah. One last thing is about the data annotation to create the grant tool that you need to train the, the, the model to recognize fake news, which is uh, actually uh, an open issue. Uh, first of all, this, uh, this information classification is really hard for the, for the user, for the people that have to classify uh, uh, a news because um, first of all, we have to recognize uh, this information, this information, malinformation. Uh, but uh, how can you uh, um, annotate uh, an article where, for example, uh, you get some not so accurate uh, data? Um, so, for example, there are some statistical data that are uh, not so precise; they are they are not accurate. But for the rest of the article, uh, more or less it's uh, all, almost is true well uh, how can you classify this this is fake because they are presented uh, not accurate uh, data or not uh, this is actually not easy to 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 resolve we have we had great debate within our uh, end user that uh, have to annotate this data 
And of course, this is a, an activity which is uh, really resource intensive. And finally, probably there is also some kind of legal issue. And I like to understand uh, when, when we talk with the um, fact checkers, uh, uh, if they had a uh, legal issue when they uh, when they uh, publish something, say for example, this is false. Uh, these people, Trump, say this uh, this is and it really it's really false. For for the journalists, probably there is uh, the there is some um, law that uh, can uh, protect you. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure about this. But what about uh, if a system? Uh, or also if someone uh, classify a news as a uh, fake news, or if a system classify a news for, as fake news, uh, there, there are there can some kind of legal issues. This is a, actually an open question. Um, but that's all. Okay, Maximo, uh, thank you very much. I'm sure that uh, some questions will arise after, after the other panelists have intervened. Uh, I'm not going, I'm, I'm going to present Janis uh, Compatsiaris. Uh, hopefully I've said uh, rightly the, the name. Janis uh, is senior researcher at the Information Technologies Institute at the Center for Research and Technology class in Greece. And he's also the uh, AI for Media project coordinator. AI for Media means uh, artificial intelligence for, for the society and the media industry. And it's also a, a wide network of researchers across Europe and beyond that focusing on delivering uh, artificial technology and training to serve the media sector. Uh, Janice, uh, one of your areas of research is uh, artificial technology, power extraction of knowledge in the social media. Uh, ranging from news and misinformation to, to other issues and environmental and security. And we hope uh, you can also uh, give us your approach to technology, data, and destruction of knowledge uh, regarding uh, this information. The floor is yours, Janice. Thank you. Okay, Javier, thank you very much for the introduction. I have a presentation which I will try to uh, uh, I will try to uh, share. Um, okay, uh, I will try to share only the uh, PowerPoint. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. We'll okay. Hear you. Okay. I also make it full screen. Can you see it uh, well? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Thank you very much. So, yes, I will discuss about uh, approaches and uh, challenges in uh, building content verification uh, uh, system. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, was uh, prepared in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Simeon Papadopoulos, who is uh, working uh, directly in these uh, aspects. And uh, we both uh, belong uh, to CERT ITI, a research center and uh, institute in Thessaloniki, Greece. And I'm leading uh, the Multimedia Knowledge and uh, Social Media Analytics uh, uh, Lab, uh, where we have, uh, I would say, a long uh, history in um, the topic of uh, disinformation and misinformation uh, detection, starting from um, uh, more general uh, uh, techniques, uh, almost uh, 10 years, uh, uh, more than 10 years uh, uh, ago. Uh, currently working uh, on more um, uh, recent uh, challenges, uh, including, for example, uh, deep fakes uh, uh, detection. And all these uh, years, uh, we were uh, supported by various uh, projects, as uh, you can see in the slide. So, yes, um, uh, the uh, fake news and um, uh, uh, related uh, activities uh, were no were uh, started some years ago. Uh, but what uh, the a key milestone was the United States election in uh, 2016, and uh, six, uh, since then uh, it has been um, a very uh, popular uh, topic. Many years ago, things uh, started in a more, um, let's say, simple way. So, you know, maybe this uh, famous uh, shark by now. In uh, 2005, uh, this um, uh, true uh, photo, real photo, was uh, taken with this uh, shark following this uh, kayaker. And since uh, then, uh, we have seen uh, this uh, shark in um, uh, various different uh, contexts, uh, most, uh, in most cases within uh, 
uh, cities, like for uh, and then in uh, again in most cases during the hurricanes, uh, like in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, New York, uh, in Italy, and so on, all over the years. Uh, uh, 2012-2017 and uh, still uh, appears in various uh, occasions. Some characteristics of this content is that unfortunately misleading posts uh, tend to spread faster and wider uh, compared to accurate uh, ones and um, uh, where they appear in terms of uh, topic uh, the most um, uh, frequent topic is uh, politics and as uh, Alberto mentioned in the uh, beginning, in many cases it is uh, uh, claimed that even uh, democratic processes uh, were affected by such by manipulated uh, content and you can see all other important uh, topics uh, like uh, terrorism and uh, uh, war, uh, science and uh, so on and um, this um, a uh, chart uh, maybe does not uh, not maybe does not include uh, the recent uh, COVID-19 and uh, vaccination uh, uh, related uh, uh, misinformation uh, issues, which uh, uh, might change uh, this um, um, distribution. Recently, things uh, became more uh, complicated. Uh, we have uh, this uh, trend of uh, deep fakes, which is content uh, generated by deep neural networks. Um, that of course seem uh, and try to be authentic to human eye and uh, they are mostly applied uh, to faces uh, again uh, in uh, most cases um, uh, for politicians uh, actors and in other cases like uh, pornography and uh, uh, so on again uh, this uh, trend is uh, gaining uh, uh, increasing and constantly uh, uh, attention you can see in these uh, two graphs uh, on um, uh, the left um, the paper the papers published uh, around guns which is the main method for generating uh, uh, deep fakes and their increase and uh, on uh, the right the papers uh, were related to deep fakes and you can see uh, again, from almost uh, zero some years uh, ago, uh, we are uh, reaching um, uh, close to uh, 1,000 uh, today. And uh, there are several type, uh, several manipulation types. Uh, you can see interface uh, synthesis, uh, attribute specific attribute manipulation, identity swap, expression swap, and uh, uh, so on as we can see from various surveys and the fact that we had uh, uh, three uh, quite complete and serious surveys ju in just uh, one year, again, it shows um, uh, the interest and, the, diff and the, 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 the many challenges around uh, this uh, topic. And uh, the quality is uh, rapidly improving. So again, in just a few years, uh, you, you can see the high quality that um, they have reached in 2018, and this is uh, already two years ago. Currently, uh, there are uh, some um, uh, results uh, with um, uh, astonishing um, uh, reality around them. So, uh, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, what is uh, being uh, what is the main trend in um, uh, verification techniques? So uh, there is a reference uh, data set, a, a, co a collection which is uh, used uh, in order to study uh, the situation and uh, uh, model uh, the uh, data and extract some specific uh, uh, features, attributes, or um, uh, as we call it, uh, verification uh, signals. And then following, in most cases, a machine uh, learning approach, uh, these uh, signals are used in a classifier in order to detect uh, whether uh, something is uh, fake or not. And finally, again, uh, part of the uh, data set is uh, used for um, uh, the uh, evaluation. So, uh, as is the topic of this uh, panel, uh, the data set plays uh, an important role together with uh, the techniques in the whole pipeline. So, for example, what uh, an example of uh, uh, attributes that can lead us to verification. Oh, sorry. Ah, okay. Yes, so for um, uh, fake news, by studying um, uh, specific examples and uh, data sets, there are several signals which uh, can be uh, identified, like, for example, different uh, uh, color eyes 
uh, artifact in specific uh, places uh, like uh, hair, um, um, edges of uh, ears, uh, earrings, and uh, so on. And as I mentioned, all this uh, can be represented in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, features which later can uh, be used uh, by classification uh, uh, approaches. Not only to deep fakes, but uh, generally uh, such uh, signals uh, include uh, the source credibility, stylometric features when we are talking about text, reputation features of the users, uh, forensics uh, features uh, from uh, maybe multimedia content and CNN features in most uh, cases around uh, deep fakes. So this uh, slide is uh, just an overview of uh, what uh, uh, we have um, uh, what we have been working uh, uh, on uh, these uh, topics over the years. So uh, we have prepared a number of uh, uh, we have collected a number of uh, uh, annotated uh, datasets to be used in uh, various uh, uh, related activities, and also a number of uh, tools. And we can you can visit and have access to most of them in the uh, websites uh, shown. Some more specific examples. So here, this it is um, a, a two hundred thousand uh, uh, videos uh, uh, dataset, which is sourced from um, uh, uh, YouTube, and they contain uh, uh, similar uh, scenes and can be used uh, for uh, um, uh, uh, near um, duplicate um, uh, detection. Since, uh, it is, as it is known in many uh, cases, uh, uh, fake and misleading content appear again and again over the years, or uh, uh, the same content is used in different contexts and so on. And uh, there are, of course, uh, challenges uh, when creating such um, uh, datasets. Uh, first of all, as I will also uh, uh, discuss a little bit later, uh, the uh, uh, YouTube has to be uh, accessed using the appropriate uh, approaches. But then uh, there is a requirement, then the, there is a need for um, uh, analyzing this uh, data in order to uh, organize and uh, annotate them in order to be a useful uh, data set. And for example, in this case, a multimodal approach is um, necessary. The annotation uh, is, of course, uh, time and effort, effort consuming by the uh, users. And uh, still, uh, this uh, data set might be um, appropriate for some cases, but not for others. So, since, for example, in this in our case, this was uh, collected uh, with uh, visual information in uh, mind. If someone wants uh, to, or if uh, a use case um, uh, demands uh, to search uh, based on uh, uh, audio, this is uh, this uh, dataset is not uh, straight straightforward. Uh, uh, it is not useful in a straightforward uh, way, and uh, several conditions should be taken into account. Another example, um, another example showing the type of uh, features uh, which can be used in this case from tweets. You can see uh, various type of uh, features coming from text, uh, language specific, uh, Twitter specific, uh, user and uh, network. Here, here you can see um, more um, uh, in some detail. And uh, in this case, uh, we have used again. Um, a classification uh, uh, scheme uh, on a specific data set to um, measure the accuracy. And uh, you can see that uh, overall uh, there is um, a, a good uh, result, uh, but uh, then depending on the language, uh, the result uh, varies a lot. So uh, another challenge and uh, requirement is uh, the availability and taking into account multi multi Regarding uh, deep uh, fakes, in this uh, case, uh, we didn't um, uh, uh, develop a data set ourselves uh, because there is um, a, a, a very um, complete uh, one, a very big one, uh, which is used in the deep fake detection uh, challenge, uh, which is organized by major um, industries, including uh, Facebook. So in this case, it has more than 100,000 uh, uh, videos. You can see uh, 2,000 real and the rest are fake, some um, uh, details. Uh, an important aspect of this data set, apart from its uh, size, is uh, that the participants are paid actors. And of course, they gave their consent. So privacy and uh, ethical issues are, um, I guess, completely uh, solved. So this is a very useful uh, data set. And 
although since uh, just a couple of weeks ago was considered the largest uh, one, in this uh, month an even largest one uh, uh, appeared uh, coming from uh, uh, Korea, which apart from being uh, uh, larger, uh, it also balances um, uh, a bias uh, towards um, uh, non-Asian uh, uh, participants. So, uh, in this case, we also have, uh, of course, more Asian participants. So these are important uh, data sets. And uh, the challenge itself uh, is uh, interesting uh, uh, because um, there are two aspects. Of course, there is a training data set. And then uh, there are um, two evaluation procedures. One is a, a public uh, one uh, where you can uh, sub where, where you can uh, uh, see uh, your uh, uh, you can see your uh, the data set and your score on uh, this and then um, uh, obviously you can adapt your algorithm in order to achieve uh, a better score uh, but there is a, a private uh, one where um, uh, you, you just see your score uh, without having access to the data itself. The, the data set is known only to the organizers. Um, our uh, results on this uh, 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 challenge, you can see in the bottom of the uh, slide, uh, top 3% in the uh, let's say public known case and uh, uh, top 5% in the private uh, uh, one. What is very interesting, not only for this um, uh, data set, but uh, uh, in general regarding uh, data sets, is that, uh, of course, the most uh, submissions did very well uh, in, in the public one and um, uh, uh, worse or much worse uh, in the private one, which uh, shows that um, the developer algorithm for, for all these teams, which were uh, more than 2,000, uh, have had problems of uh, limited generalization and uh, overfitting, like, for example, the best submission in the public one uh, scored 0 0.19, and here this uh, score, the lower is the better, but in the private one, the score was uh, 0 uh, 0.19. Uh, seven, uh, 57, and uh, they are uh, in the 900 uh, uh, positions. So this is a challenge uh, with, um, uh, I will say, a more general cha uh, challenge in many uh, data sets together with other uh, problems. And uh, other challenges around data sets, which um, uh, have been mentioned also uh, before, is uh, especially from uh, social sources, uh, fragmented um, uh, access to uh, the data since uh, its um, uh, uh, source uh, use uh, different APIs with uh, different policies uh, which uh, can also change over time. So new effort is needed uh, for approaches to uh, uh, adapt. Uh, there are um, limitations uh, in, imposed and uh, um, uh, full access can be very difficult or extremely uh, expensive. And um, uh, it is very good, of course, that uh, Twitter uh, opens up uh, uh, the uh, access. But in the past, have been many cases of um, uh, non-transparent data access practice. So some organizations seem to have uh, access to content which was not uh, available to, to others. And then another um, uh, challenge is um, uh, related to user privacy and purpose of, uh, purpose of use. All these, uh, I will say, either fuzzy or very demanding uh, framework. Um, for example, GDPR uh, regarding uh, mining user contributed uh, uh, data. In many cases, it is very difficult for researchers and even for legal experts uh, to uh, find out what really can and cannot uh, uh, be done. And uh, I hope I have time for uh, this uh, slide as well. Uh, another challenge is uh, related to human uh, behavior, and uh, there is this quite uh, recent uh, uh, paper where it is uh, shown that uh, even when the uh, detection algorithms are not uh, just algorithms, even when a, a human proves that, uh, for example, a fake a news position which was already believed is uh, fake. Uh, then it is very difficult uh, because of um, uh, personality, psychology, and um, other societal uh, related uh, aspects. It is very uh, difficult uh, for humans to change uh, their minds. 
So another, uh, not maybe not uh, technically re uh, related uh, challenge is even that even if al an algorithm would uh, perfectly uh, work, this wouldn't immediately change uh, the uh, opinion of the users. So yes, the final conclusion is that uh, yeah, at the end, uh, as I mentioned, there are many uh, challenges uh, around data availability, their coverage, and uh, how representative uh, they are, uh, uh, the approaches, uh, how robust um, uh, are, and uh, whether the results uh, can be uh, reproduced. Uh, um, another technical challenge uh, regarding selection and fusion of other uh, of uh, other modalities. And uh, there is a required contribution from various disciplines, including analytics, machine learning, network analysis, and so on. And the, the challenges around the uh, ethics, privacy, and GDPR. And especially for data sets, uh, it seems that there is a need uh, from um, uh, multi-stakeholder analysis of the problem, including computer uh, scientists, uh, ethicists, uh, social scientists, and policy makers. Uh, Large-scale collections in real world uh, misleading and synthetic content, so the algorithms can be uh, trained and adapted more uh, efficiently. And um, uh, in addition, more systematic measurement of uh, the, uh, the impact uh, this um, uh, this uh, content uh, have uh, moving uh, beyond uh, the symbol, uh, uh, the current rich impression um, uh, uh, measurements. Um, just before I close, uh, I would like to invite you to visit the AI for Media uh, uh, web uh, site. It is uh, more uh, a network. It's not just a project which develop technologies. Uh, there are uh, horizontal training uh, uh, activities and road mapping activities, and you can contribute and have access to these activities. And we have this uh, notion of associate member, so you can visit the site and um, uh, uh, apply for it. And um, uh, regarding uh, this uh, uh, deep fake uh, uh, detection uh, uh, service that I very uh, briefly presented, it is uh, uh, developed within the framework of the We Verify project. And then, if you, if you want to have uh, early access to it, uh, you can contact us and you, we can arrange uh, some um, early stage uh, uh, testing. So, Thank you very much for your interest, and I'm sorry because I I took a little bit more of the time. No, thank you very much for your insightful presentation, Janis. We have a couple of questions for the audience for for you that we will uh, maybe we can share after after the the victoras. Uh, I want to introduce. Uh, I'm very glad to have here uh, Victoras Dauxas. He's the head of the the bank EU. Ivanki is a Lithuanian-born initiative uh, to efficiently monitor trending and potentially harmful information narratives. Um, well, I, it includes uh, his, pro his project has these uh, two parts, which uh, I really like. It's a uh, very high intensive use of technology. It includes uh, artificial intelligence-based analytic tools. But it also uh, counts with the participation of volunteers, journalists, and people from civil society researchers who verify the information that the verify claims and verify uh, the issues that they automatically detect uh, using technology. Um, in the Bank EU uh, also um, uh, counts with uh, newsrooms in order to. Um, uh, have a great reach with their uh, verified content and they are able to reach the 90% of the Lithuanian audience with content that has already been verified. So, uh, uh, thank you for being here, uh, Victoras, and we are uh, very glad to, to know more about the Bank EU. Uh, Javier, thank you for such a nice introduction and uh, big thanks for Fandango team for organizing the event and uh, Thanks for having uh, me here. Uh, so I will share of how our work is done. And so basically DBank is now working in uh, doing analysis in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Poland. We analyze this information in all of these four countries. We also do projects in North Macedonia and United States. Uh, primarily, we are focused on analyzing disinformation and misinformation. Uh, then we do analysis during elections, what kind of influence campaigns are being run during this, those elections, and we work to interrupt them. Uh, 
end, we do a lot of uh, media literacy at a large scale and uh, trainings for different audiences. Uh, our best process, uh, best practices and processes that uh, it's very important uh, to have a very clear and open process how you analyze information and uh, uh, be careful when, when automation is used with a black box method and uh, to make it uh, as possibly explainable for the audience as well as actually what's actually happening there. So what we have done over the years is that uh, we mapped out more than 2,000 disinformation outlets that publish disinformation all around the world. Uh, currently, we are monitoring in 26 languages, and uh, uh, we can easily launch in any any country, or we can start to monitor any other problematic outlets that publish uh, disinformation or misinformation, and then we can run further analysis. So the step one is the, uh, the AI part, where uh, the scoring and um, recognition of uh, harmful narratives happens. Uh, over years, we mapped out uh, 25 narratives, uh, the top level narratives that tend to repeat every month, every day. And we uh, were capable to automate the system to do that. And the sub-narratives is more of on a message level in those narratives. And there are, in different analysis, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of different messages uh, that uh, later are aggregated for the analysis. Uh, we use um, uh, crowdsourcing, so we, we have more than 50 volunteers who are helping for the analysis. Uh, and we also have a staff of uh, 12 analysts who are doing the analysis, and uh, later we publish the reports uh, uh, within the media. So basically, uh, there are a few important things. Uh, when data is gathered, uh, it's called a discovery process, and then we go to analysis process where data is labeled and the actual people, the analysts and the volunteers are working with the data and a single methodology to do that. Uh, from that, we generate all the charts and uh, then we put all the charts in the reports and then we publish and I will show how this actually works. Uh, so just I want to differentiate two processes. One is discovery of the harmful content and the second is the analysis of the harmful content. In discovery process, uh, we are uh, capable to use more of different algorithms uh, with the less precision because in some cases we search things for what we don't know that we need to know. In that case, no algorithm can be very precise uh, because we need to discover something that is not known before. Therefore, we are okay to use all kinds of anal uh, algorithms here to test out uh, uh, what we find in different narratives, uh, and uh, then it will be reviewed by actual people, uh, the volunteers or the analysts. In the analysis process, uh, we can only use uh, features that we uh, that are explainable and that have 99 or 100% precision rate, uh, because we use this only for to automate part of the processes, so we could do the analysis much faster. So uh, every month we receive more than one, one million content pieces from um, uh, disinfo media and. Uh, thousands and thousands of content pieces from uh, Facebook open pages and groups uh, that contain disinformation stories or misinformation. And uh, uh, basically every month we manually review at least 15,000 content pieces that are analyzed and labeled by the analysts and, and the community. Uh, with that data, we can train the new algorithms and we can learn how to move forward. Uh, so we worked a lot on the methodology. So uh, it's more than 20 analysts working on this every week. Uh, there are five PhDs or professors uh, working to improve this. And uh, what we're doing with um, uh, the methodology, so basically we focus on two different types of information. We focus on disinformation and misinformation. And we analyze uh, this information uh, from what we call the three-step analysis. So we concentrate on the source. The source can be website, the source can be author, the source can be journalist, account, or a group. Uh, then we uh, assess the content, uh, what's inside the content, what narratives are being spread there, uh, whom it's useful that these narratives are spread. And the third is the circumstances. What are the surrounding circumstances, events, and uh, what is the explainability of the things that we are seeing that are happening? So this methodology has worked a lot to improve uh, for uh, with all the team. The new things are implemented, and uh, 
we are testing physically to test out if this is working practically or if it's not and then we reiterating again uh, that's our map of disinformation techniques uh, actually we ma mapped out 11 disinformation techniques uh, but later reduced to seven uh, because just to reduce the clutter and uh, overlap between them and to reduce just the uh, amount of mental energy ne needed to assign to different stories uh, what's the actual result of what we do? Uh, so we published more than 20 reports on COVID disinformation. Uh, in last month's report, we analyzed between seven and about 7,000 content pieces. We found 1,400 content pieces of myth and disinformation. And we visualize, uh, show what kind of techniques are used, uh, what was the outreach for those stories, which narratives were most popular. And then we publish and present it to uh, different uh, media organizations and uh, stratcoms and other stakeholders in the countries that we work in. Also, we do events from that. Every uh, report later is turned to a briefing, and then we do briefings for uh, different communities in, in the Baltics. Uh, these briefings are quite popular, uh, and uh, every month we do COVID-19 uh, disinformation briefing, NATO disinformation briefing, and uh, some other niche topics also. This is an example of a report, uh, so we can present uh, what languages were used to spread this information, what were the peaks, we can explain the peaks, uh, what were the trigger stories to uh, start those peaks, and uh, then we can do the timelines and present what's like, why, uh, how this was formed. Also, we map out these different media sources, uh, and we can see uh, which of the media sources published most of the disinformation and misinformation. And later, by using debunk reach methodology, we can analyze which of those sources actually made the biggest impact. And uh, as you can see here, uh, not only by the number of articles, the impact is important. It's also important, like how big are the um, uh, accounts or the outlets that publish that particular story and how many people were reached. So that helps to define uh, which of the stories and narratives made the biggest impact. Uh, then we present the case studies for uh, what, what what's being spread, uh, uh, what was claimed, uh, what's our ver verdict. Uh, so de we debunk uh, those case by case cases. And we present them as a learning uh, mechanisms to educate our uh, volunteers, the Lithuanian elves, and uh, our partners in other countries. Uh, this is another example that we work on this information that is spread uh, by Belarus and uh, Kremlin about Belarus nuclear power plant. And uh, we do this analysis together with Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And this, this is also published every month. Uh, we did election monitoring projects, one in North Macedonia, one in Lithuania. In uh, Lithuania, we analyzed more than 8,000 content pieces to uh, finalize the report. Uh, you can find this report also on our website. And from all of this, we do the events to present or the live streams, as in here with the Lithuanian chairman of uh, uh, parliament, uh, live streamed in the second biggest media outlet. Uh, when we do uh, big reports, uh, then these reports typically are turned into TV shows, and those TV shows are published by uh, the local media and the countries that we are working with. I mentioned that we also do media literacy campaigns. Uh, so this is a large one with a bad news game. Uh, and uh, we re So this is the game that educates people on six disinformation techniques. And uh, by Cambridge Research, uh, it um, uh, makes them 20% more resilient uh, just playing the game for 15 minutes. So what we did, we did a huge campaign and uh, 118,000 people played the game in the Baltic states, which is a really amazing result. If uh, you're interested more to hear about this, just contact me. Uh, we work on disinformation training, uh, which is really important uh, because when there is many people working on the analysis, there is a problem that um, uh, they might understand the same things differently. And probably that's uh, what uh, Fandango team and our teams are experiencing, that when you add people in the system, if they are not trained properly, they will interpret things differently. And uh, you might up uh, in a huge trouble when you need to publish the report or you need to explain what's actually happening there. So therefore, we're working on a, a digital course uh, to create these standardized uh, methods and methodology and training. So we could train uh, whatever number of analysts all around the world so they would understand things more similarly and their results could be comparable. 
all of our reports are published on debunku.org, uh, so you can find all of our work here. And uh, if you see possibilities to uh, do something together, or uh, if you're interested in our work, so please just contact me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Victoras. It was really interesting to see some uh, uh, practical, uh, practical approach. Um, I'm going to read some of the questions that the, the audience uh, shared with us. Uh, I think uh, I, I will have two at least uh, for Janis. Uh, one is from Vittoriano Bancini, and uh, it asks if, uh, when you explain uh, uh, this video analysis, uh, can you still detect? those changes in the image when no when the image is resized or recompressed this uh, is uh, an additional uh, challenge yes of course resizing uh, causes uh, a big problem uh, obviously and uh, when it becomes uh, much uh, smaller then uh, the um, efficiency of uh, the algorithms uh, uh, decreasing uh, again, uh, with uh, decompression, uh, another uh, uh, challenge, uh, some um, uh, initial uh, artifacts and uh, attributes uh, are uh, modified, so might be difficult to, to detect. So, uh, yes, as we call it, uh, uh, detecting all this in, in the wild, uh, so with uh, uh, actual, uh, with real world uh, uh, content generates uh, a lot of um, uh, challenges like the ones uh, mentioned and um, uh, uh, new techniques uh, are um, uh, needed. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when new techniques are developed, new kind of uh, modifications and manipulations are, uh, um, uh, are applied as well. So this is a, a constant uh, race uh, for the moment. And uh, of course, uh, the training and education and other kind of uh, aspects that were mentioned uh, by Victor are uh, very, very important because uh, from many resources, technology alone cannot provide the solution. Maybe an initial uh, guidance, an initial uh, indication for someone to start um, uh, investigating something, but it cannot uh, solve uh, the, the whole situation. You, you, the, the three panelists, agreed that the human factor is still uh, pretty much needed. And uh, I also wanted to know your opinion. Um, as, do you think it's uh, if if you agree that the the professional, the journalist, or the, the citizen will always have a, a role in in uh, judging what is uh, true or not? Uh, is it uh, the right end to try to reach like a hundred percent automatically uh, verification system? Uh, because uh, well, I, I just wanted to know your your opinion about this issue. No, I, again, it's for me. Massimo, you are you are like you have a clear idea of it. <laughs> I actually, actually, I'd say I am not an academic researcher. I am, I am a researcher in an ICT company, and I have to, uh, I have to say that it's sometimes it's embarrassing if we are uh, talking about the uh, to the detection of manipulation of images or videos. As Yanis has already said, uh, most most people believe that uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning, AI in general is something like the the, the civil ballot that can solve everything, but actually it, it was embarrassing if we if, uh, if we can uh, um, analyze an image that uh, even a child can recognize it's a fake, but the but the model trained can cannot recognize it and maybe say it's uh, mostly some something like it's 99 percent true, which is actually something that oh even a child can recognize it. This is actually a fake image. Of course, because the, uh, the, the model are trained to recognize uh, techniques to manipulate images. And as, as Yanis has just said, uh, um, these techniques change, and you have to be always updated with the, with the model and to train the model to recognize this stuff. And it, actually, it's not easy at all. On the other side, I have to say that uh, when this tool are useful, really useful, when you are not able to recognize that the images is manipulated, but the system can
can do this. That's why I say no to your answer, to your question, because I, I cannot believe that we were able, because it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a circle, you have to run to, to be updated, it's not easier for, actually, um, you probably, you'd be very specialized to, to follow the, the activity that the, the, the people, the, these information agents are, are uh, reaching to manipulate images uh, or, or, or whatever they use as a technique to create this information. So at the end, I, I, I cannot believe that we can provide a system that would be 100% basic on automatic detection. No. And uh, do you want to add something? Uh, like to... OK, thank you. Victor, ask, please. I would like to add a comment. Uh, so you know, uh, algorithms and humans you know, both need to be trained. You know, <laughs> either a human or the, or the algorithm, uh, both need to be educated and trained uh, to do some specific task well. Uh, when we speak, uh, can things can be fully automated? Can things can be fully understood? You know, uh, we already have a 2000 years and we still don't understand everything as humans. So why would we expect machines to do that for us? Uh, so it, this is not very logical, uh, even from the philosophical perspective. Uh, where I would like to add the point, and I think where uh, what is important to discuss, it's important to understand what features can be automated to improve human work. How can we enchant humans to do better work? What processes, what mechanical processes can be automated to make their work easier? And when we start to focus on the processes to improve uh, our journalist work, our analyst work, our researchers work, here we can, where we can actually open new levels of productivity and new things can be discovered. So I would focus on this. And our last four experience shows that by focusing on this, you can actually deliver results. Because you see what kind of processes needs to be automated because it just takes too much time for humans. And then humans concentrate on more creative tasks that uh, machines cannot do yet. And this is an evolutionary process. What wasn't not possible to automate last year, it's possible to automate uh, this month. So I would uh, change this perspective and because uh, uh, some people are actually scared of AI will you know overtake the world or whatever. Uh, but this is just uh, you know thing from movies. Uh, so just let's make things really clear and simple. Uh, algorithms are as humans. If they are trained to do something, they just can do really fast. Yeah, thank you for your insight. Janice, uh, I, I think that you you already said that you agree with this with this. Uh, yes, yes, I agree very much with uh, this uh, position. Although, of course, I have to say, since I come to, to, from the technology uh, side, that uh, of course this is the answer. Uh, nothing can be automated one hundred percent. But indeed, on the other hand, many processes can be supported, and uh, uh, algorithms can assist in the whole uh, process. And uh, this is also uh, improved over the years okay I, I would love to continue this conversation because I have a, a, several questions that I would love to, to make to you but I think we we have to continue so I I just want to thank you for your your insights and thank you very much for participating with us it was a very interesting conversation from my point of view thank you thank, thank you. you very much for the invitation to the event and the interesting panel Thank you. I think that uh, now we will have uh, Francesco in the stage, I, I think, with me. Mm. Yes? You, you are muted. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Maybe, maybe we can uh, have a five minutes break and uh, and then we can start the the new the next panel i would like to invite uh, after 5 minutes of break also riku that is our project officer and uh, i would like to thank him so we will uh, so just wait for 5 minutes so people can can uh, have a coffee break we we cannot offer a coffee but <laughs> next time we hope that we can have a physical meeting and so we will see here in uh, in uh, 5 minutes Okay. okay, so we will leave the stage um, empty and uh, let's meet here in five minutes. Thank you very much to the audience. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.
Can we start again? Hi, Rico. Nice to see can you. you can, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? What? I don't wonderful. just say hello. Hi, this Silvia. Is not Silvia. <laughs> now we would like, but uh, we the, the um, audience can hear. Uh, we can start again. I think that you are. There. No, I think you have to wait all the panelists. Okay. But uh, we will start uh, in a very few minutes. We are pretty in time, so um, I think that... Uh, I'm, here I'm here just to I say hello to Rico. I leave the floor. <laughs> Hi, Massimo. Uh, I know we'll that... Uh, dry, we'll see you again Rico, in May. Do you, yeah. Do you enjoy the, the event? Oh, very Rico. much. Very, very interesting. I'm really happy that you organized this. It was really uh, thank you. Very yes, good. and then uh, I was surprised that we have a lot of attendees, uh, and uh, this is good. This uh, means that uh, the topic is quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, also within the commission, there, are, there. Are, I was already asked if if uh, this project can be considered as a success for in the disinformation area and. I've already yes. reported this, and so it's it's really uh, it, it's a timely project, to be honest. Since yes. the <laughs> in, since the inception, like we exactly. discussed at the kickoff, so it's uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yes, and uh, it is uh, Fandango is also mentioned in uh, one of the cold topic, the human uh, 0127. It is okay. mentioned that the project uh, have to be in connection with the, the Fandango project. So this yeah, yeah. means uh, yeah. that mm -hmm. uh, you you have done a, a great job <laughs> to push <laughs> Fandango. <laughs> well, we we I, I when we have good projects, we we push them, and uh, we've had a lot. And uh, now with. Um, the Horizon Europe and uh, Digital Europe programs. Uh, yeah, Francesco, go ahead. No, no, this is a good project also because we have a good uh, PR, let me say. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and I a good coordinator. Like, okay. Good coordinator. Yeah. It I, always I helps. Like to, to, I don't know if, uh, I don't understand, so, sorry, because this is not my technical, uh, I mean, ignorance, but I don't understand if we are live. Or we, if we yes, we are live. I think that Massimo and myself we... can leave the stage. Yeah, 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 yeah we are leaving. Eh? To, 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 I mean, introduce to everyone Riku, because this is, uh, is our project officer, and uh, we are very happy to have him as project officer. Was, uh, is a perfect project officer, let me say. And... Uh, Something well, that I would like to now. Now I would like <laughs> to stress, stress something. One of the problem in the European Commission is that the so called the silos problem. That is different uh, silos, and the people don't interact. We have seen that we need a lot of uh, synergies and inter interaction in this. Uh, and Rico yeah. was uh, excellent in this aspect, uh, and uh, he understand how cooperate. You you have seen here that we have. Uh, uh, at least two units, because there is uh, yeah, uh, well, Rico Alberto in Luxembourg units, yeah, and yeah, Alberto yeah, in another unit. Yeah. And believe yeah. me, I can say this is not common in uh, in my SP past experience. So we we okay. uh, engineering uh, is, is uh, running a lot of projects, and uh, I would I explicitly say this uh, because if this event is good, uh, uh, and I hope so that uh, oh, everyone is enjoying. Uh, this is also thanks to Rico. So yeah. So, okay, so thank you. let me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Massimo, let's leave the floor. I give the the space to yeah, the no, other panelists. Yeah, 
Uh, Rico, so, please go ahead. No, I just want to to thank you uh, both Silvia and Francesco for the this excellent project. I mean, it's it's. I can't believe it's already three years. I mean, when we this project started in um, 2018, and uh, this information was a hot topic then, as it is now. In 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 2018, we were talking about the election issues, uh, let's say Brexit and, and and elsewhere, and now we have the the pandemic, and this information is a big problem during this pandemic and we, we need to find uh, solutions to, to tackle it. And one way to do it is a, is a data-driven solution with AI. I think with Fandango you have been able to find ways to deal with this to, to a certain extent. Now with uh, journalists, they need tools like this to help them tackle this information and identify it. I mean, we have blatantly obvious uh, disinformation that floats around, but the, I think the most dangerous ones are the that you can't automatically detect. That's where the tools are needed so the journalists can do their work and not uh, accidentally uh, propagate disinformation. So I think uh, what you're doing is very, very important work. And I, I hope this continues in the future and uh, also there will be other op many opportunities in with the uh, new uh, programs that will start uh, in 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 a couple of months time to continue this work and i i, I really do hope you do do this yeah. so yeah thanks thanks a lot. thank you absolutely thanks and, a lot and yeah. thanks uh, also to for uh, to all the people here we will conclude yeah. at the end but uh, yeah. Just to to use this time because at the end is uh, yeah. is uh, we are for sure under pressure and uh, mm -hmm. I would like to say that uh, I'm very happy to have this community around this problem because this is yeah. a, a new problem and I think that we should start a new community in other in other yeah. aspect I don't know health or agriculture yeah. using that artificial intelligence there is a long tradition uh, there is a strong community but I think yeah. this is a strong problem that need a strong yeah. community. I'm very happy to have yeah. here uh, four or five projects represented and uh, in, yeah. in different yeah. units. Uh, well, I think that, nice. yeah. yeah, this should be just uh, a starting, uh, not, uh, not yeah. uh, I hope that we can continue to collaborate with this, all these people. Yeah. I, I wanted to say that now we have this drive towards uh, data spaces and I, I mentioned about the standardization and interoperability and this is a big big thing now and uh, i actually sit in the standardization working group of dg connect and uh, we are we're tackling this this particular problem now through big data value association and i mean we need to find ways to identify the gaps in standards and 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 to uh, find also ways to enhance the interoperability of data sharing. So this is something we're yeah. doing at the moment, and I think it will continue in the future as well. Yeah, so absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. I answered you in the in the in the chat. Uh, yeah, I fully yeah, agree. Yeah, I think yeah. that uh, this is similar. When we, we in mm. Italy we have just one telco operator. And what is the the, the 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 leverage when there is the number portability and you can move your number to another another operator? This is open the market, open the competition, and this is yes. similar. I cannot move my yep. data from from Facebook to another social network. Yeah. I think we should work on this for the interoperability yeah. to open the data and to, as you say, the standard is important because I can use my data. Absolutely. If I if I have yeah. a, a, a car, I can go and have gasoline everywhere. This is exactly. not the case for the data. We we should no. move in this direction. I fully agree so, with you. I mean, we have the Data Governance Act, which was adopted in the Commission recently. I mean, this is a work in progress. And this relates directly to the data spaces. And uh, so in, in, I think, two years time, we should have something concrete. But it's, it's I think we're working on yeah. it and we're moving to the right direction. So, yeah. so now okay, about so, the ecosystem. Uh, uh, Francesco, I think like... we should start uh, with the pilot. Uh, I will yeah, leave yeah, the stage yeah. with, uh, and uh, leave the, the floor to the panelists. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting the speakers that came but uh, i i would like to say that 
uh, this is uh, the next panel will be about the, the ecosystem that include the business part. This is also business opportunity, and we will uh, we will have uh, more projects that will be presented in this panel, and uh, with a specific oriented uh, hi Alexandra, specific oriented hi Hello. Mike. Good morning. We we are going to move to this uh, to this more uh, let me say business aspect. We have seen policies at the beginning, then we have seen. Uh, uh the more technical and scientific aspect uh, very good presentation indeed and now we we, are, we can discuss a little bit more about the business uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, dedicated to sme and startups i think this is a very interesting uh, and uh, and uh, we will have also projects that uh, use cascading funding or coaching the sme so this is uh, will be about uh, Alexandra, the first presentation. She is a head of knowledge and technology transferred at uh, Hanover University, and he is also leading the Media Future project. That, uh, if I understand, is about data, space, and about the um, also the uh, possibility to support the SME or entrepreneurship about this. So Alexandra will uh, will talk about this. Grazie Francesco, I'm very happy to be here and I would like to thank the Fandaco project for inviting me for the excellent results. Congratulations for your final event. It has been a pleasure to be here and to read, to hear so many fantastic presentations and very insightful for us as well, since Media Futures is a very young project, which started last September. I will try now to share my screen and let's see how it works here. Uh -huh. It might take some time, you see. Yeah, sure. Let's see. I have to drag and drop the file. I apologize for the... No problem. For a delay. So, yes, so Media Futures is a data-driven innovation hub for the media value chain. And actually, when we wrote the proposal, we didn't expect the pandemic. It was written and submitted before the pandemic started. So I hope now that you can see my slides. I have uploaded them in the portal. So in Media Futures, um, as I mentioned, we started the project at, almost at the start of the pandemic. It was an interesting coincidence. And actually, this pandemic made us realize that we have to further develop and data literacy while at the same time go beyond and explore media literacy because media is a discipline per se so it has its own deontological code value expertise so we need to to bridge the disciplines together and what is more media futures also brings the artistic domain in the mix so the artists and support to the artists is a core pillar of our media futures project because we are after all part of the STARS ecosystem. So the project is funded by the European Commission. And even though we are still at the start, we have managed to achieve a lot in these um, few months. So let me see how I can change my slides. So we have now very powerful technologies. So we have the filter bubbles, AI, and this has given a lot of power to um, angles such as misinformation or hate speech. We have seen the rise of harmful content, for example, towards certain societal communities. And we have seen also that there is a lot of clickbait and there are certain short attention spans that we all have. So in that sense, we all tend to look in our cell phones, and at the same time, we are kind of drawn in the, um, towards sensationalism. So the goal of Media Futures is to, actually the, the slides change on their, on their own automatically um, here. So I'm not sure how this happens. Okay, so maybe as you have known by now, so Media Futures goal is it's to reach. Not, it's not mine. It's, I know, I thank know, you. <laughs> I know, I know. System. It's maybe a fake, a bot or something yes, like that. Yeah, exactly. It's trying to, to yeah, to, <laughs> to 
limit uh, the reach of media futures. Yeah. So our goal is to, to reshape the media value chain and to ensure the compliance with the European values that we discussed also today about like GDPR and also go beyond that. So now I will click to change my slides. So basically, my presentation will not be that much technical as a warning for that. It's a more a business project. And of course, we have data science having a leading role uh, in that sense. We will be focusing more on how we can develop the media ecosystem in Europe and how we can support new artists, SMEs and startups that want to be active in the entrepreneurial domain and develop new ideas. So we focus more on the grassroots, let's say, civic tech projects and also citizen initiatives. And we want to use them to further enhance quality journalism and at the same time contribute to our existing participatory and digital democracy. So this is the first call to action. If there are SMEs, startups or artists here among us, or if you have contacts in this domain, please encourage them to look about Media Futures and apply to our program. So this is our goal. And to implement that, we are actually launching three open calls. So Media Futures will uh, have a duration of three years. We will be launching three open calls and at the same time we are managing an innovation fund which is very kindly and generously allocated by the european commission that has the height of 2.5 million euros so this innovation fund will be allocated in total to 51 smes and startups and 43 artists which will receive equity free funding and at the same time they will be trained by our customized um, acceleration program and also the residency that we offered uh, for the artists and I will be speaking more on that uh, now so I'm very happy to see that the slides do not change on their own so I can manage that well now so here is a wrap-up of what we offer so besides the mentorship and the training we are offering up to 80k equity free funding which is very important because uh, SMEs and startups still can remain independent and make their own decisions and they receive this big support from us in monetary terms, but also in terms of uh, training, networking, and also connections with VCs and other innovation networks. For example, we mentioned before BDVA, IDSA, and all the digital innovation hubs community, which is well, very well established across Europe, and we should work more together. At the same time, we offer up to 40K for artists. So I will be now presenting our open call. It has closed, so you cannot apply. Uh, but nevertheless, we will be launching our next open call in autumn. So please stay tuned. So in our first open call, we addressed the key core part of misinformation and disinformation. This is a core pillar of media futures. And as we are facing our this pandemic, we focused a lot on exploring various angles that have to do with COVID-related data. So our first three challenges are related to the pandemic thematically, and they explore various uh, related angles. At the same time, we also offered an open challenge. It was very positively received uh, by the interested applicants. And in this open challenge, we defined the generic frame framework and we invited SMEs, startups and artists to really unleash their creativity. So this is what we did thematically for the first open call. Another interesting aspect of media futures and what is important for us in terms of innovation is the fact that we have three different tracks and these three different tracks will remain also throughout the project. So also our next two open calls, which will be launched uh, this year and the next one, will be having this open track, this track approach. So our first the track is focused on media and artists. So we are inviting artists to apply. Our second one is focusing on SMEs and startups. And our third one has a very innovative approach of actually bringing SMEs and SME startups and artists together to collaboratively work and explore innovation. At this point, I would like to say that many professions have been impacted by this pandemic. And one of them is also the artistic sector. So as we know, for the safety of the population, cinemas, theaters, museums are closed, artist exhibitions as well. So in that regard, I'm really honored and proud to coordinate Media Futures because I really hope that artists can apply, can see that we are having this call for them 
and they can benefit from us during this very difficult period for them. And of course, it's very important to consider the importance of art. So I know sometimes speaking with STEM people might have its challenges. And I would also like to say that art is very important in terms of creativity. So art can help us think out of the box, be creative, and also develop solutions that can be more interesting for the customers. For example, in terms of design thinking or let's say customer friendly products. So it's very important from a business perspective and also in research in general, having creative thinking always has a big plus value. So this is an overview of our program. As you see, um, the successful applicants will be guided by us through many stages. Each stage has specific requirements. So we are not just giving the funding or just giving the training. We also have expectations because this is after all funded by the European Commission. So there are very high standards here. So we are passing the successful applicants through various stages where they have to really fulfill requirements that are part of the program. And the more successful they are, the more funding they received towards the latter stages. So this is again the overview here with the different uh, tracks and the mixed one in the center, just to give some information for the interested applicants and also colleagues among us that would like to know more about how MetaFutures internally works. Our review criteria and selection criteria are listed here at, at the same time. Inclusivity and diversity is very important for us. We want to further cultivate this art tech component and also to, to make sure that we select the best projects and uh, tools. In fact, we received many high quality applications. So selection has not been easy. But nevertheless, we have, been, uh, we have made our decision and we are now finalizing this process and officially will be able to announce the successful applicants in April. So for interested people in the project, our next open call will be starting sometime between October and December. And for more information, feel free to, to email us. So what is really important for me also at the personal level is that in the media futures, we are going beyond disciplinary sandboxes. And I would really like to highlight the importance of that. We have to bring together all domains and each domain, each discipline deserves its own respect because it has the specific expertise. For example, the policy making, the data people, the researchers, the artists, the business people. So as we can see here, uh, Media Futures covers a wide spectrum of activities. And at the same time, we focused a lot on community. So we want to mobilize communities at various levels and also media communities and beyond artistic communities and also the general digital innovation hub network established in, in Europe. At the same time, data is the, the oil, as we know, nowadays a key motor driving the project. It is, after all, a hub, a data hub, Meta Futures, and we are having uh, our methodology for that. There is already a website um, set up for that where you can take a look. Of course, we are still at the start, but nevertheless, we focus a lot on collecting the data sets and tools and offering. And one of the major outputs of the program will be a customized data innovation toolkit, which will showcase the lessons learned in, uh, in Media Futures, so the Media Futures experience, and at the same time, how we have helped and supported the, our, our applicants that are successful. Also, the delivery of training and learning materials, because what we offer is customized for to serve the purpose of Media Futures and that to tackle misinformation and disinformation. And we enable a lot of the access to data, technology, and we deliver this expertise of our partners via trainings and sessions offered to successful applicants. So there are many boxes ticked, and we have very high goals that we want to implement. So yes, as mentioned before, unfortunately, we're now finalizing the contractual process. So officially and legally, I'm not allowed to say more about our successful applicants, but that will be happening very, very soon. So it's this April and we will be having our communication campaign. As mentioned, we received very high quality applications for from many innovative SMEs and startups and very creative artists. So we are really happy and proud and we will be having many communications campaign to show you how they started and how they developed during our Media Futures program. So more of that will be happening very soon. 
So I would like to showcase proudly our Media Futures Consortium. We are per se a very multidisciplinary project and we work very well together and we have very exciting discussions. So we have our data science tech experts, things called Luncheon, Eurocat and ODI. At the same time, we have a leading artistic partner, Ercam Centre Pompidou, that is taking care of the residences in our consortium. We have our Louis, which is the leading university in media and training journalists, journalists nowadays. And we have our innovation experts, for example, Thambala, then and uh, NMAVC and Leibniz University Hanover, where I'm working. And we are taking part of the innovation uh, angles and the business impact. At the same time, legal framework is very important for us and for the project and the European Commission. Thus, we probably have our partner, Kao Louvain, who is taking care of the legal aspects of the project and also delivering training because it's very important to train the young generation of, um, of SME startups and artists. Young, not in terms of age, but in terms of starting to venture in these new domains. We need uh, to have this literacy, um, data literacy, media literacy, and also literacy in the domain of ethics, AI, and to be aware. Because, um, for example, I'm going very often to, or I went rather, before the pandemic to, to conferences, and sometimes there are very various ethics angles that have not been considered, or people are trained, for example, in one domain, and they don't have this wide spectrum to also consider um, other important areas and integrate them in their work to make it uh, sustainable and ensure its uptake. So we have a hub approach as a project and um, this is our consortium behind Media Futures. So that being said, um, I would like to, to, to thank you for, for hearing me today. Thank, we will thank be... to you, Alexander. Grazie, this is very, very... Yeah, this is very, grazie a te. This is very interesting, very interesting. And we have seen also the artistic perspective. I I think this is uh, interest, very interesting because artists have, have, have also this uh, leverage to educate people to, to uh, I mean, uh, disseminate the, the ideas and the culture uh, against the, the disinformation. This is very interesting. and. Uh, Okay, now we will pass the floor to Jefferson, that is uh, an SME that maybe can apply to your project, but they have uh, <laughs> a, a, already a lot of success and they are also inside Fandango, one of the pillars of Fandango. And uh, I, we would like to have him, Jefferson, is the head of current services uh, at this startup named uh, Siren that is uh, in uh, in uh, Ireland, but is uh, also with Italian guys there. So it's a good example also of uh, European ecosystem. So uh, Jefferson, the floor is to you. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, mm -hmm. Francesco. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's great to be here with you guys and have the opportunity to to talk a little bit more about. Uh, this information and the challenges we have, like the handling big data and focusing on the market as well, uh, aiding organizations and uh, private companies uh, fighting this domain. So I'm just gonna uh, share a quick presentation. I promise not to bore anyone to death, so it will be quick and uh, uh, I'll show some more interesting stuff in a second. So let's see, uh, yeah. I'll do the same challenge here, uh, trying to figure out how to share it. So let's see. It has to be uploaded as I found out. So you have to drag and drop the presentation in that uh, platform. And oh. it takes some minutes to upload. So I've been there, so I'm sharing my experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I avoid uh, any kind of PowerPoint. Uh, we, have no problem. we support each other in Europe. <laughs> I'm, I'm not in that. <laughs> Oh, let's stop at this. So yeah. share. Well, I can actually just share my whole screen and that will probably be a little bit easier. Yeah, I think that you can share the screen directly, no? Yeah. There is a button. So... Yeah, it's because uh, okay. it, then it doesn't show the, the screen specifically. But ah, okay. It's perfect, yeah. So, can you guys see perfect. the screen? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. 
Okay. So just a quick introduction about Saren. Uh, Saren, like uh, uh, as Francesco was mentioning, like uh, uh, our founders uh, were Giovanni Tomorello and Renaud Dobru. Uh, Giovanni came from Italy uh, to do research in, in, in the Gaul University. Uh, and then Renault as well followed like in the same program. So the, they led a team of over 30 researchers in the NYG, which is the National University of Ireland in Galway. And uh, they did research about semantic web uh, and how to better uh, integrate information, right? So create a really meaningful information from the data that we have available. And it, it, there were quite a few different areas, like they ended up having uh, over uh, a couple of thousands of citations, like some collaborations with MIT, uh, on the same topic uh, until they uh, found like a, a, a good line and the company was founded in 2016 as a, a, a product company. Uh, in the beginning, developing a couple, uh, uh, the classic uh, startup environment with fail fast. So uh, develop a couple uh, attempts on uh, solutions that would scale like to this ecosystem uh, until they finally reached like uh, the origin of what Siren is today uh, about two or three years later. So in for the past uh, three to four years, we have uh, been growing like uh, the technology and expanding. So Siren actually stands yeah. like for uh, it's an acronym uh, that means semantic information retrieval engine, right? Uh, which is uh, at the end of the day, uh, something that Siren does behind the scenes to enable uh, uh information to be analyzed so that is basically uh, applying concepts like uh to aggregate vast amounts of information in a way that is simplified for non-expert users right so it's enabling people that are not engineers now to work uh with volumes of data that traditionally would require like a uh, data science uh processes to be in place so we've developed a, a couple uh, patent requests like this take uh, unfortunately a few years to be to be approved, but they have an, a number of them uh, submitted in the area of knowledge graph, graph and distributed data processing, uh, especially to support this type of technology. And we we have received like uh, uh, a couple series of uh, funding, like so we had seed funding and Series A, and we're doing a Series B investment now. Uh, by a, a number of intelligence investors, uh, a private equity fund uh, in Ireland, and also uh, Bob Griffin, uh, which for people that know the intelligence market, like he, he was the former CEO of uh, IBM i2 as well, which is the largest intelligence product uh, uh, in the market uh, to date. And our focus as a company is basically on creating what we call in investigative intelligence and hence why Fandango is an interesting part of uh, what we do, right? Uh, it's basically enabling people to do investigations. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of the nuances of that. But uh, the main markets for this that uh, we target like uh, uh, as a private company is like a open source intelligence. It's a very common type of analytics that is probably the biggest overlap with what uh, Fandango targets. So it's analyzing information that is uh, available uh, on the internet, right? But we also have endeavors in law enforcement and intelligence agencies in other type of intelligence, uh, financial crime, so fighting like uh, fraud, uh, money laundering, and so on, and also cybersecurity and threat hunting, uh, given the uh, investigative approach of the platform, right? And we have been engaged in a number of real world problems, uh, uh, being Fandango to fight misinformation and disinformation, right? Uh, and as well as other uh, organizations we partner with, like the National Child Protection Task Force and also the Anti-Human Traffic Intelligence Initiative, uh, which are two other groups that uh, we work in partnership as well to support these causes. So, what is about uh, investigative intelligence? When I'm talking about that, and here is where it becomes essential to uh, fight uh, disinformation and misinformation. Uh, it's combining different concepts that are available uh, as solutions and technologies in the market, but in a way that is uh, segregated, right? So there are solutions that focus on big data, 
So they, they, they do certain types of process for big data. There are other solutions that are focused on analytics and business intelligence perspective, right? Then you have some solutions that focus on link analysis and others that are focused on search. But these are usually uh, apart from each other uh, and it's quite complex when you want to uh, use the different capabilities. Uh, our perspective is that to foster investigation, uh, you need to unify these concepts in a single uh, environment, right? Where the user experience goes through all of these concepts in a unified way and not like having to use different tools. Uh, by combining these perspectives, then you enable the shifting uh, uh, of paradigms, right? So you can look at the data from different perspectives to get the insights you need. And, and this is uh, the way that users are enabled to then find scenarios that they wouldn't otherwise see in the data. So just to give uh, a big picture here, like uh, I'll try not to go very uh, deep into the details, but uh, traditional analysis versus what we call the modern big data analysis uh, have very different requirements, right? In, in the past, what we did to analyze data is basically uh, have, we have a question, then we model our data and uh, we process it to do ETL, like which is extract, transform and load uh, to fit that specific question that we have. And then we have a use case that can be analyzed, right? So, but what happens is every time I have a new question, there is new work to be done. And that means that there is constant rework and often uh, in scenarios like fighting misinformation where things are ever changing and constantly adapting. Uh, you don't have the time to have uh, a solution to be re-engineered before you can actually tackle the problem, right? So the solution with that is to actually have a platform or uh, an ecosystem where the, your data can provide real time correlations, right? So you no longer need to remodel your data to answer a new question. You have the ability to fluidly navigate through the data in different perspectives as your questions arise. Uh, and this is very important like for uh, every type of investigation, but especially when you're talking about misinformation, what happens is when you find something, you want to know more about that case, right? So you need to deep dive, uh, do a deep dive in certain scenarios, but that depends on what you're being presented with. And uh, I'll show a little bit uh, of some of the, the things, these concepts, uh, how they can be uh, unified and consolidated in a, uh, in a single approach, right? So the, the goal is to uh, have this consolidated in a single perspective, like we've done uh, a fair part of the work for Fandango in a way that this can then be leveraged by uh, people that are not uh, technical, uh, but that understand the business. Like journalists, we understand the business of uh, disinformation and misinformation. And if they have to always rely on an engineer uh, to get the work done, then this impairs their ability to focus on the business, right? So I'll jump into uh, one of the scenarios that I wanted to show here very briefly. So let me just find my tab now. So yeah, perfect. Uh, now, uh, here is just like a, one perspective to show how in practice uh, this type of technology can aid uh, journalists, right? So I'll be brave here and I'll do a, a live demo. Uh, and I'll try to avoid the slides so uh, it's not as boring. Uh, so here you have a, a, a collection of news that in the last seven days, uh, I have about 4 million uh, news publications that have been analyzed for sentiment and then scored like you can see here the progression of news over time and then this is the projection of where the worst sentiments about the news are in the world right so you see that there's a, a high concentration in china because china happens to have a lot of publications but it, we can drill down different topics here to quickly get a perspective of what is happening around the world, right? So if there is a key uh, topic that uh, I want to understand, I can, for example, so very uh, uh, hot topic, Zeneca 
I can search for AstraZeneca here. And this, you see it immediately shifts uh, what is the perspective around the globe about the, a certain subject, right? And it, you can see the progression here and you, you can actually read the specific content. Uh, that brings one of the challenges, right? When working with uh, uh, information, which is aggregating information in multiple languages. So you you see that there is multiple language, languages written in these articles, uh, but we have established an NLP process that can actually extract information uh, in a unified way, uh, even across different languages here to facilitate that type of analysis. So this is enabling like quick analytics uh, with large amounts of data, right? Um, what I'm showing here is just a sample of the last seven days, but there is like billions of uh, articles here. And then enabling search over that, right? But there, there is more to it that is allowing connection of data, right? So sometimes I want to see data in an interconnected way. So if I uh, just resume here my full articles, maybe what I really want to know, and I have here a database of politicians collected from Wikipedia, right? Just so uh, we have like a, a global base of politicians. So now I can look at the politicians here and maybe I'm interested in what is being talked about French politicians. Uh, so I have the information of the politicians here. And now that interconnectivity I was talking about, that is the ability to change the perspective without changing the data. So I still have my articles as they existed. I have my database of politicians here, but now I can actually uh, see what is being mentioned in the news about these politicians specifically, right? So I know here like a, a, a quick context that I, I have six uh, and, uh, and I have thousand articles that mentions specifically these 955 politicians that are French politicians. So I can click here and I can quickly shift my perspective to then see what are the news about these politicians. And you see that uh, the rest of the world has a, a more moderate view of the French politicians compared to France, right? And this is a common effect like the, uh, the local media will always be a little bit harsher on the uh, the politicians in general. So this is just to show how uh, we are shifting the the perspective of working with uh, pre-processed data to work with data that is analyzed in real time to give uh, context, right? And this is also what we have been doing uh, in Fandango is enabling this interconnectivity and leveraging the other capabilities that are being developed inside the project, like uh, uh, the classification of articles with like a, a scoring uh, authors, publisher, to then integrate this all in a single platform that journalists can benefit them uh, from having a full picture. Okay, I guess that's mostly what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you. And, uh, I look forward to answering any questions later on. Yeah, yeah, we will yeah. see later on. We are planning to close at uh, one o'clock, maybe a quarter uh, to, to one. And But I hope that we will have time to have questions. Now there is uh, uh, Ernesto, and this is uh, interesting. And Ernesto is a colleague from uh, engineering, and he is head of a Homeland Security Research Unit. And uh, is, uh, again, this is another aspect that we have not uh, touched uh, up to now, the fact that this is also a security problem. In Homeland Security, there is a, a lot of... Uh, initiative also in the in the commission in the part of the security because this is a uh, is a problem that this information and misinformation is a problem that also involve the different countries outside europe in a way or another and uh, ernesto will talk about uh, another project that is reveal and uh, this is a, a project uh, with some specific uh, investigation aspect and so i will leave the floor to ernesto and we will see also this uh, other, other perspective uh, for the disinformation fight thank you very much francesco i don't know if uh, you have seen my screen uh, not yet uh, 
I share the entire screen so it should be easier. I understand we need some little bit more time. Uh, yeah. One. I don't know why. <laughs> so uh, uh, I sent to Ulanla um, also the presentation. I don't know if easier uh, she can uh, she can share the, um, the slide. Maybe she she should join us in the in the stage. But uh, yeah, I, have you tried with the share button? Yeah, but maybe, um, I, maybe I, I find it is explained before that how do this. Eh? No, it's a problem of authorization, maybe. I understood that we have to drag and drop the presentation from our laptop to the box space that opens when we click on sharing. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a problem of, of, of um, authorization, I think. It seems uh, um, I don't want to. If you have the, the, the possibility to share the one the, the version that I sent, maybe it's easier. Mm, but you you sent to me or to Olala? Uh, to Olala. Okay. Okay. Uh, in, in case uh, Nestor, we can shift uh, with Mike. Maybe and uh, you can do oh, perfect. later Thank on. You. Yeah, so yeah. We're gonna, I, I, I don't know if Mike has, uh, is ready, <laughs> and you can you can share the screen. But it, Ma, Mike uh, is from uh, VRT, is a, a pillar in this uh, ecosystem, and probably a lot of you already know him. He is head of international R and D collaboration at VRT. And uh, he will talk, uh, he's a, a, a pillar of Fandango as well, but he will talk uh, a little bit about uh, um, a, another project and uh, uh, that is uh, named the Media Motor, but he will uh, give us the a perspective also from the uh, VRT that is a large broadcaster in Belgium. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Francesco. I think you can see my screen already. Yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yes, good uh, afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Maton. I'm working at uh, VRT. Uh, VRT is one of the partners in Fandango, uh, but I'm not going to focus on Fandango today. As uh, Francesco said, I'm going to tell you uh, a bit our story of what we did in terms of ecosystem building and also how that links to, to some initiatives we're doing around uh, disinformation and, and fake news. Uh, so first of all, for those who do not uh, know VRT, VRT in one slide. So we are a public service media organization based in Flanders for the Dutch uh, speaking community. Uh, we're running TV channels, radio stations, some digital platforms, uh, among which a news platform. Uh, you can see some numbers on our of our daily reach uh, on our platforms and the motto of VRT is uh, to inform, inspire and unite and to reinforce the Flemish uh, society in Belgium. Uh, you see six strategic goals. Uh, I want to point out uh, the third one which is on uh, bringing reliable information as a common reference point as do uh, public service broadcasters have to do. Uh, so that is certainly important and that also makes that uh, tackling this information is one of the strategic pri priorities for VRT both for the newsroom as well as for what we do in, as activities in, uh, in the innovation team. And the sixth uh, strategic goal is also important. Uh, collaboration is part of our spirit and our mindset. So uh, we do almost nothing alone. We try to create an ecosystem and, uh, around everything we do in the organization. A uh, little bit about the innovation team, uh, where I am working at VRT. We are 35 at the moment. Part of it is a prototyping and user validation team which actually is the team that is engaged in the Fandango project. Uh, but today I'm going to, to focus a bit on some other teams we have in the innovation team, which is our corporate accelerator, VRT Sandbox, and uh, our international network, which we are building through the future media hubs. Uh, in terms of partnerships, we're, we're, we're running 17 collaborative projects uh, together with our team and together with other units in the, uh, in the VRT. Uh, and I'm going to mention a few of them uh, during my presentation uh, today. Uh, so first of all, why, why do we want to build uh, uh, an ecosystem? Uh, what well, collaboration is a bit the mindset. Uh, we want to learn and innovate together with strategic partners among us. 
both partners in the R&D domain, uh, universities, R&D centers, and we have been doing that uh, with, with our R&D team for like over 20 years now. Uh, but the second thing is we want to bring innovations all the way down to the production floor at DRT and try and validate things in real uh, close to or even operational environments, which of course brings challenges and risks. And we also identified in the R&D projects we do, there is a difference, there are some differences in speed. So uh, we're doing uh, technology R&D, which sometimes goes slow. Uh, if the technology doesn't work immediately, they have to retrain the models and that can take, uh, that can take a while or reinvent the models even, whereas product and service innovation goes quickly. And then at the same, same time, we get many requests from startups to collaborate uh, together with us, startups and young companies who are building new products but we cannot really lead them into the collaborative projects in Horizon 2020 because it takes almost a year uh, to, to get something started and run and a year in the life of a startup uh, is, is <laughs> very long. Uh, so we felt the need from, from startups to, to set up a program uh, to, to collaborate with them. And that's actually what VRT Sandbox, which is our corporate accelerator, uh, has become. So what we do, we identify interesting startups uh, by actively scouting or they come to us. Uh, we try to look for a match inside the company, so for disinformation, uh, startups working on disinformation technologies, uh, that would be, the logical place would be the newsroom. We try to identify a match and then uh, a project starts uh, together with, with the corporate unit. It's closed wallet, so that means we don't pay the startup for the service they bring, they don't pay us uh, for, for the services we provide them. And in the end, uh, we capture the learnings and we document uh, together. Uh, just very quickly, a few of the recent examples of startups working on, uh, on, on this information related technologies that we have been collaborating with, uh, Trendalyzer, which does automatic detection of stories going viral, Easy Insights, which is uh, an emerging news, uh, news gathering tool, uh, which, which also see, uh, allows us to see some trends. And then very recently, last year with, with Bottles and ML6, we, we built the COVID buddy chat bots to allow people at home to kind of ask questions around uh, the many fake news that is, uh, that is spread around COVID-19 uh, in recent uh, years. So, all those cases are kind of live. Uh, I can't go into details now because uh, I want to restrict the time here, but uh, I've included the links uh, to each of those cases uh, in my presentation. And there is a lot of audiovisual material available on, on every of those cases on our, on our website. But actually, so we have the sandbox, uh, but actually what we also fend, felt is that startups like to work together with us, uh, but they are also looking for opportunities to do business elsewhere in Europe. And Europe is a very hard space for startups and scale-ups because there are many countries, there are many uh, languages, many cultures, and especially in the media and creative domain, the, the borders and the culture differences and the language differences are, are still there. Uh, so we actually got a lot of requests from startups to also help them in this aspect, in the internationalization of, of their business and to help them cope with, with language, language barriers, cultural barriers, and also legal and policy barriers. Uh, and actually, we started this kind of international collaboration uh, cooperation uh, as part of what we call the Sandbox Hub, which is an international network of, of uh, media companies and accelerators that have a focus uh, on media, which kind of started as an EU-funded project, uh, but which we are currently, which is now running uh, further self-funded. Uh, so the future media hubs, uh, of which the, the Sandbox Hub is now a part, is a VRT initiative. So we are funding it in collaboration with RTBF, and RTBF is the uh, uh, French-speaking uh, public service media organization in Belgium. So together we are running this. Uh, and, and the objective of the Future Media Hubs is to boost innovation, accelerate the development of the media industry by facilitating partnerships and mutual exchanges between public and commercial media companies. And in order to do this, uh, the Future Media Hubs is setting up several hubs. Uh, one of them is the Sandbox Hub, and you see the members of the Sandbox Hub here on the, on the slide, which is this uh, international uh, network of media companies who are in one of way or another running an incubation or acceleration program for, uh, for startups or have a formal way of collaborating with startups. And what we then actually do is we, we organize monthly meetings and do introductions uh, and on the Top side, you see, for instance, startups on the vertical axis, you see the different media companies. And we try to actively find matches within this network, introduce startups to, to each other, 
uh, in order to allow startups to expand their visibility uh, within Europe and across the borders uh, in Europe. So this is running as a VRT or TBF uh, funded initiative. And then we were actually actively looking to add things on top, like uh, coaching and mentoring services for startups and, and more opportunities. And this network, the Future Media Hubs, is actually further engaged in, in two projects, which I'm going to very briefly touch now. Uh, I will go, I have to refer you to the websites for a lot more information. I can only briefly touch it. Uh, so Media Motor Europe is a Horizon 2020 project, which we are coordinating at VRT uh, to create this more engaged and better connected media innovation ecosystem in Europe. Uh, and what we are actually building uh, with Media Motor Europe is a mentoring program for startups and scale-ups in the media domain. Uh, so Media Motor Europe aims to nurture high potential European deep tech innovators solving today's most, in, most uh, prominent media industry challenges and support them in building media solutions of tomorrow. Uh, we have a consortium of seven partners. Uh, there's basically four uh, accelerators in the consortium, VRT, Media City Bergen, uh, then we have the Sofia Knowledge City Cluster and uh, Termi Ventures in, in, in Greece, uh, who are mainly running the startup uh, coaching program. And then we have a few supporting partners in the project F6S, ATC and, uh, and Fast Track uh, Action. And these are the media challenges that we have set forth. Uh, and as I already said, fake news misinformation is kind of a high priority target. So this is one of the challenges uh, that uh, startups can apply for to get coaching from, uh, from within uh, the Media Motor Europe uh, program. Uh, the project started last year. Uh, we had already two open calls. Uh, and every open call, we selected 20 startups to join uh, the portfolio. Uh, and then we are actively linking those startups with media organizations to set up collaborations. And we're doing, we're helping them to get more uh, client introductions as part of this uh, mentoring and coaching program. Um, a few of the startups uh, that have been selected and are, are running uh, through the projects uh, are, as I said, uh, working on those uh, fake news and disinformation technologies. Uh, so uh, we have Adver Verify, Varia, Factiverse, Maven, the Fudger, Text Game. So each of those companies is kind of building uh, a product uh, that helps media companies or that can help media companies to um, to uh, solve problems around uh, around this information and, and fake news. And we actively want to bring them together within this project and also together with the future media hubs to form like an international ecosystem where, where Europe can grow in building solutions for uh, for this information and fake news, also from within those uh, start innovative startup community. Uh, just quickly, uh, if there are startups interested in joining the program, they will open a third open call next month uh, for the third support cycle running from July to uh, December. Uh, then uh, to finish uh, the second uh, project I wanted to introduce to you is the stadium project. Uh, where we actually also want to boost the opportunities and success of media startups in cooperation with corporate and venture partners. Uh, where we also want to create, again, growth in the European uh, media ecosystem and allow young European companies in the media tech domain to, uh, to grow uh, their business. Uh, consortium here uh, consists also of seven partners. Uh, there's, again, four uh, accelerators in the consortium. There is a VRT uh, with VRT Sandbox, the NMA, which I noticed was also in the Media Futures uh, project, so uh, we have them on board here. There is Storytech in Estonia and Media City Bergen in, uh, in Norway. And then this is uh, expanded again with supporting partners like F6S, Marto Innovate, and the EDU. Uh, focus areas uh, for Stadium. Again, we did this together with the consortium. I think nothing will surprise here in terms of topics, but also here, uh, the content verification and fight against this information is kind of uh, actively seen as a, as a problem to tackle with uh, the news industry in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so Stadium right now has its uh, first uh, open call uh, for startups to join the program. Uh, they can join uh, a four-stage uh, program where they can get funding for uh, developing a product or a prototype together with the corporates. Uh, and Stadium has in total of funding available of 3.7 uh, million euro uh, to, to give away to startups and, and innovators, of which now half of it will be distributed through this first open call. 
Uh, if you want to apply, you have to be quick. It's closing 31st of March, so that is uh, next week. Uh, a little one-minute video uh, to finish uh, around the stadium projects. Are you a media startup or scale-up working on AI, data, content creation and distribution or monetization? Are you ready to integrate your media solution live on air? But do you only miss the funds and network to make it happen? That's why we're part of Stadium, unique piloting program. We're excited to bring you, the media sector and investors together to boost media innovation. On top of that, we're able to get 150,000 euros for your project. So if you are driven to turn your innovation into practice and experiment by collaborating with us or other media players, then this is the right program for you. Are you a oops? And then finally, uh, my last slides uh, for today on the ecosystem uh, building. We are obviously not only looking for startups to join our uh, ecosystem. Of course, we need to be able to link the startups and to give them opportunities to make business in Europe. So we are actively looking for uh, corporates and enterprises uh, in the media domain in Europe to also join our ecosystem. Uh, so if you are a creative media industry organization and you're interested to, to get connected to opportunities that, that startups and innovators in Europe can bring to you, uh, you can also join uh, our programs and actually both uh, projects have an open call also for media corporations to join which is open all the time so you can if you're interested you can you can register your interest uh, at any time uh, you want uh, so these are some of the ecosystem building activities uh, we are doing at uh, at vrt we are running and we are very happy and very interested to connect those initiatives to, to other uh, re relevant initiatives across Europe and to, to see how we can connect this and collaborate on fighting uh, also the problem of fake news and disinformation in Europe. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, again, we started with the policy from top down, but we I think that is very important also to have uh, this bottom up approach uh, with the startup, the cascading funding uh, and this kind of uh, of, uh, of project. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so now we will pass the floor to Ernesto. Ernesto will try to uh, share the presentation. Mm, let's try again. Uh, ah, OK, you, you will try. OK. Ernesto, uh, no, I, I have the same. I, 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 yeah, well, if you can. I, have, I have the same, uh, the same problem. So if you can uh, share it much better. Yeah, I will try. Yes, yeah, seems that is uh, uploading the file. Okay. Okay, you can see now. Yeah, yeah. Th th thank you, thank you very much, Francesco. We, uh, you already introduced Bye, me. Fine. I don't want to, 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 to spend time to present me to introduce me again. Um, you, you can go ahead with the first slide that presents an overview of the reveal yeah. project. Uh, uh, reveal means uh, uh, reveal disinformation over the internet. The, so this information in this case is uh, uh, targeted on what happened uh, on, uh, on the web. And uh, uh, also reveal, uh, as uh, mentioned uh, Jefferson, uh, um, some minutes ago, uh, we adopted an investigative approach for discovering this information. Why? Uh, because uh, the, the, the goal of the project is to detect uh, communication campaigns that are malicious. Malicious means uh, spread for illicit or for malicious purposes. 
In this case, uh, uh, we um, adopted a, a different perspective because uh, this information uh, uh, is one thing that can be also, um, but the, 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 the denigration is another important point. Uh, that we targeted. Um, sometimes uh, uh, denigration is made uh, through uh, disinformation and mani or man um, misinformation, but uh, sometimes with the real information that no one knows uh, just to, 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 de to denigrate someone else. So uh, in this sense, uh, uh, we um, targeted different markets that includes uh, once uh, once more uh, the thing, mm, yeah the potential target of the reveal service are uh, media companies of course that needs to have to assess the truth trueness of the of the news uh, but also uh, public stakeholders in particular politicians uh, we, we discovered in uh, and the interviews that we uh, made uh, the last part of the project uh, are, uh, have been uh, really interested on this service. Business company, because uh, they need to protect their interest from, uh, uh, against uh, uh, defamation uh, campaigns, and social media providers uh, that, of course, could integrate this, uh, mm, this service, uh, uh, embed this service uh, uh, to assess uh, the, 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 um, the news spread by the users, uh, take into account what happened in other, place, uh, uh, in other places of internet. Uh, next one. Francesco, thank you. Uh, also, in uh, Reveal, we adopted uh, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, uh, web and social media scrapers and mappings, uh, uh, in different kinds of information fusion techniques, uh, um, semantic reasoning, and uh, propagation graph. But according to our experience, no one of this technology can uh, address alone the, the, the problem. <laughs> we need to, to use everything together and uh, uh, put in relationship all the pieces of information that are extracted by uh, all of these uh, services and reason, reasoning on top to understand what is happening around the fact. Sometimes this fact uh, can be explained alone, but should be considered in, in the light of other, other facts in, uh, in the same period. And uh, one next, uh, next Francesco. Uh, for, for this reason, uh, the, the news graph intelligence is the basis of the reveal uh, analysis. Um, of course, what is included in this graph um, is something already uh, discovered, detected, pre-filtered, analyzed, and then put on, on, into this graph because it is relevant for the specific campaign, campaign, communication campaign that uh, the user is monitoring. Uh, in this sense, uh, uh, user can see the, uh, all the, the, the sources that are um, targeting, uh, are um, facing about a specific fact, and can include or exclude, uh, exclude because it's possible to, to, to customize the system, the, the role of social media that in, my, in our opinion, uh, and according to the, the analysis that we made with the, uh, the potential and the users are really important because uh, most of the um, fake news or disinformation campaigns have been um, continued, if not started in the, into the social media. Uh, next one. And this is the, the, the flow that we adopted uh, till to, to, to give uh, everything in the, in the graph. Uh, 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 and this, uh, this stage was 
already uh, explained. In the next one, we can see what we can do in terms of investigative analysis on the disinformation campaign in the next slide. Mm -hmm. Next one. Next one. Next one. <laughs> This one? This no, one? no, 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 next one. Uh, okay. I, I already said everything. Okay. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. This, this one. Okay. I don't want to spend no, so no, much time. it's fine. Yeah. Uh, um, so, um, the, the information that are in, in the graph that we, we said before have, uh, are analyzed from different perspectives, from sem semantic point of view, in order to extract uh, the, the entities involved, the, the authors. Uh, the, um, the contents, of course, understanding the, uh, the, the text, um, extracting the emotion of the text in order to combine all these factors to have uh, an indicator for the potential risk to have disinformation denigration campaign in that, uh, in that graph that is related to one fact. Um, why the importance of the analytics? Uh, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, the, 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 the answer is not in that graph, but in the graph of the news that are in that period. So the timing uh, um, of dimension is really important uh, in, in uh, the context of the reveal project because uh, some news uh, are functional to other news, to cover other facts, to the state, the, the, the public opinion, and so on. In this sense, the analysis of the time, uh, how this, uh, this graph is going uh, in one week, in one month, in, uh, and uh, the, the uh, measure in the, at the same time, the level of emotion, the level I think that Ernesto has some connection problem. Yeah, so we, we, we can wait uh, two minutes and uh, to see if uh, can uh, reconnect or, or uh, however, we are quite uh, close to the end of the of the event. Uh, we can have maybe time for some uh, questions. I don't know if there is some questions uh, Yeah. At least it's a good slide. Uh, we have a lot of content to see. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, yeah, that's true, Jefferson. This is a good slide that demonstrates how complex is uh, integrate all this aspect. Uh, and this is just, uh, just for the, yeah, the system advised me that Ernesto has lost uh, the connection. And uh, this is interesting, these slides, because it's a demonstrate how we can uh, use this uh, kind of tools, uh, try to integrate. And uh, we have uh, already told a lot about the fact that the, at the end, uh, we can use these tools, but the, uh, the final user, the media professionals, the journalists, uh, and the fact checkers uh, are the person that will be in charge to to investigate in this sense uh, for this data investigation part, but also to decide at the end when there is uh, a, a something that is a warning. It's not easy to, de to decide and uh, we all think that technology can, can uh, improve uh, this decision and uh, also because we have the problem of to be, to be fast. So, the, no, not I mean, the journalist has, has the problem to be fast. I, just to conclude, uh, I let me say that we are in time to close, uh, and uh, this is very... Francesco? Ah, Ernesto, okay, you are back. Okay, we, yeah, we sorry, started to sorry. conclude. I was... Uh, I was uh, <laughs> I yeah, now, maybe you can... You can sorry, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I'm but connecting we, again by, by, by mobile. So, okay, uh, in the slide, can, we can uh, see the, these uh, analytics... Yeah, we, uh, just in two minutes, I can I can finish. Yeah, uh, the analytics uh, that uh, um, give the, the different dimension of the phenomena uh, and uh, the clustering. The clustering allow to discover if some of the 
data source that is monitored go in uh, another uh, way in uh, tr try to to, um, to to spread another uh, uh, vision of the same fact this is important to understand if someone is attacking our business or uh, the business of the the person that we are that i uh, is using uh, um, reveal uh, ne next one This is the graph, uh, okay, In, nothing more to, to, to add. Um, the, um, we can go ahead um, to, to thank the, um, also Esper System and uh, Cap Digital that uh, worked with us in, uh, in, to, in, this, uh, in this system. Um, and uh, to, to, um, to to ask uh, uh, to contact me for, for more details. Uh, ju just a final comment that regarding the, the um, involvement of the citizens. We involve the citizens uh, uh, in many areas uh, uh, with uh, some questionnaires. The feeling was that uh, was, uh, uh, the, um, they have uh, um, in particular uh, they are worried about uh, the distortion of the, the news uh, made through the social media. And uh, in the different social media, there are different way to, to, to the di different level of confidence that it depends on uh, the users uh, that normally um, use uh, such a social, social media. In this sense, uh, reveal uh, through the investigative approach can allow the end users to uh, discard uh, the rumors from the real news and to uh, put everything into the, um, the, the, the boundary, the, the scope of their interest. Of their interest. Um, if uh, there are questions, uh, yeah, uh, I, no, I can't just, just, uh, yeah, read in the just, chat, <laughs> please ask. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, we, 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 are, uh, we should close uh, uh, not after one o'clock because the, the, the connection will, will disappear for everyone, but we are in time. Just one question, uh, Ness. What, what, uh, in which program uh, has been funded? Because we have seen many different projects uh, from different uh, uh, topics, probably all are about uh, H2020, uh, Edmo was funded by uh, CEF, Connecting European Facilities. And I don't remember your project with, with, uh, in which program uh, has been funded. Ernesto, can you hear me? No, probably not. We have lost Ernesto. He yeah, seems okay. not to have internet okay, connection. Okay, okay. No, 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 I remember no, no. my program. If you wanted to, have to mention no, it. We, yeah, I, I, no, because uh, again, this is an important aspect. We have uh, different resources. Uh, I hope also maybe the infrastructure part of the Commission can be involved uh, uh, to fund this because we need the infrastructure. Not just the connection, but also the infrastructure for the data is another important, important aspect. We hope also that the next generation EU will be uh, take care of this aspect, uh, both for the infrastructure, because it was dedicated to the infrastructure, but also for the education, the education of the young people. Some of your projects mentioned these. Uh, and so we have, uh, let me, let me concluding. Uh, uh, if there is no questions, I think there is no specific question, but we discussed it already a lot. Let me conclude that uh, this is the first step. We have uh, a lot to do also in the future. So we have to, we hope to receive uh, more, more support from the Commission. This is for sure. I think that everyone is, uh, is, uh, is uh, thinking uh, and hoping about this, but also to put together the, all the, all the aspects, uh, all the synergies. So again, thanks to this uh, final uh, panel speaker, but thanks to the old people that are here as speakers and uh, as audience. Let me thank you also Olala and Xavier from Chivio, that is the partner uh, in, uh, in Fandango dedicated to the communication and dissemination, and they supported a lot. 
also to organize this event. So if there is, a, okay, Ernest is back, but we are just Sorry. concluding. And uh, again, thanks to Riku, I see in, in, the, in the chat. And uh, that, that's all. I hope that we can see naturally that we, we can see all together, maybe face to face in a physical meeting uh, next year. To, to have also some uh, coffee break or social dinner or whatever. And, uh, and we hope that we will continue to investigate uh, uh, this important challenge and this important problem. So, if there is no other question, thank you very much to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Grazie. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice Ciao.